killing it. Um, yeah, so let's let's um explain to Joanne. So Janae is here, she just must have stepped out and Anna Corley is not gonna be here today. Maya hopefully will I I'm not Maya says she may not be here. Today. Okay. Um and then Mia and um Anthony. Anthony. I wanted to say Andrew, I knew that one right. Um <laughs> Anyway, very sharp crowd, Yay. and um, to be in the picture. You, no, you're not staying back there. The whole time. <laughs> um, now, do, if um, I have a fear of being video. I know, right? <laughs> you just ruined it. Wait, 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 yeah, we're, we're, we're streaming now. Yeah, I think she just ruined it. I'm the, whoa, I didn't sign a royalty deal. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, because um, I can do something here, are you going to be in here the whole time? No, mm -mm, just but, for a couple of things. Okay. Um. All right, do you, you care if I... Do you want me to run it? Uh, you know, first I have to ask Diana a question. You just go ahead and start. So has everybody signed in and everybody's got an evaluation form? Great. Right. This is the CE credit class, so they have to. Lord, they get to evaluate me. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you didn't bring lunch. I know. Uh, you know what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so trouble. I do have Uber Eats on regular rotation right? on the, the phone, so we can just yeah, order in some sandwiches. Because <laughs> <laughs> I also had. Um, well, my name is Joanne Bolt. I run the Bolt Group. Um, as they, as y'all have been told, I um, we are a mega team out of the coming location. We have an expansion group here, and we are about to open possibly an expansion group down in Water Robins as well. So I'm out of production, which has been a whole different thought process on how to run your business. And um, I'm probably busier now than I was when I was in production. So if that's your goal, eventually know that you're just busy in different ways. So, but when I was in production, the thing I did for our team with listings. Um, I haven't worked a buyer in years, but I can work the listings market like nobody's business. So that's why they asked me to come in and teach the price your home section of the night. <coughs> so let's get started. Um, the first thing we want to talk about is market statistics. Now, how many of you have actually been in business before or done some real estate before? Are we taking it at night because we're brand new licensed, or are we mm -hmm. taking it at night because I've done a little bit. Done a little bit? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think pricing the home is one of the hardest jobs you'll do in real estate. Because if you get it wrong, you are messing with people's financial pockets. And if you get it wrong, you can quickly get a reputation amongst their friends that you have no idea what you're doing. So you got to really be spot on in your pricing because if you overprice it, what's going to happen? Not gonna sell. Nothing. It's not going to sell. And if you underprice it, what's going to happen? It's going to sell really fast and you just cost them thousands of dollars. Now the problem for me is there's no magic link, button, or gadget anywhere that you can just hit and say, give me a price. If you could, Zillow would be doing a lot better with their estimates. <laughs> I mean, let's just call it what it is, right? Zillow tried that with his estimate. And they're wrong 40% of the time. Why? Because especially in Georgia, Zillow pulls its estimates based on tax records. Well, you know what happens in Georgia a lot? We don't record finished basements or a lot of other improvements that we do because our tax assessors are too busy to actually go out and check everyone's home. And because of that, people can get away with not telling people that they should be at a higher tax assessment. And so for that reason, a computer-generated system like his estimate will never be right in Georgia. It can be a lot more right in places like the suburbs of Chicago where you got a lot of townhomes, row houses and stuff and they're pretty cookie cutter. Zillow can be right in big uh, um, townhome condo complexes in Atlanta. You get out where I am in the summer, they're never going to be right. So there's no easy button on pricing your home. You've got to be a student of the market and always be watching the market to find out how to dictate the price of the home. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so, um, one of the first things you want to do is pull up your market statistics. Does anybody have an idea how to do that or what we're talking about with market statistics? 
I like to be interactive. Y'all have mm. to talk back to me. Yeah. Or with me. No. Yeah. What are we talking about when we say market statistics? You're trying to make sure you capture that region and make sure and stuff that you're in a radius and stuff applicable to that house. Okay. So what kind of things are we looking at for applicability? Well, layouts and stuff, uh, square footages, um, years of construction, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and recent sold. Recent sold. Days on market. How many days is it taking a certain home in a certain subdivision to sell? What's your absorption look like? How much inventory is out there? Because in a time of market where you've got 20 homes for sale, your pricing is going to look different than a time when you only have two homes for sale, right? Inventory just shifted. And if inventory shifts, you might have to go up or down in your price for the same home that it can, and that's why it can change every 30 to 45 days. What kind of market do you guys think we're in right now? 14 weeks. About a 14 week market? So would you call that a buyer or a seller market? So it's a seller's market. How come? How much inventory is out there? Inventory is low. It needs six months. For Depending on the price buyers. range, right? Uh, from, I think I was looking, it was one, 100 to the threes. Mm -hmm. Inventory is getting limited mm -hmm. because those people are buying those homes quicker. The higher price homes, the inventory is still there because they're sitting on the market. I would agree. I think we're kind of in a both market. I think up to about four fifty five hundred thousand dollars, we are absolutely in a seller's market. Anything above that, I think we're in a buyer's market. Which is really interesting when you start looking at the fact that we're sort of shifting into both markets. It <coughs> means we're we're in a shift. We're leaving the buyer's market and heading into a. I mean, sorry, we're leaving the seller's market and heading into a buyer's market. That's the only time you see two <coughs> shifts or two markets happening at the same time. Now, you can sit through every meeting every day long and hear people tell you things like, we're in a buyer's market, we're in a seller's market, but unless you're in FMLS and you're studying the data, all you're doing is repeating what other agents are telling you. I encourage you that FMLS should be one of those things you get up and you look at every single day over a cup of coffee. Why? Because the numbers don't lie. It's the best thing about numbers and math. It doesn't change who it is and it doesn't tell an untrue picture. The numbers don't lie. So if you want to be the expert in your area and you want to be the expert at the, um, at the kitchen table trying to get a listing for someone and you can pull the numbers out, not just quote, oh no, we're in a buyer's market because you've heard someone else say it, but you can show your seller the numbers, they have a, a whole lot harder time going with a different agent, right? Because you've now established yourself as the expert. So what do we talk about when we say the numbers don't lie? I'm going to get back here. Is this okay? So one of the first things I do every single day is I pull my FMLS up. I set up a market watch for my area, the area that I'm more likely to sell a home in. You'll set it up in the area that you're working in. It could be a subdivision and it could be um, an entire zip code, it could be a city, you know, whatever area you're trying to sell yourself in, do a market watch. What happened? Oh, interesting. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to see here is how many new listings today have gone on market. Now you can change this to 24 hours, 3 day, or 7 day. I like to keep it at about a three day. In the area I'm watching, there are 1,088 homes in the last three days that's gone on the market. So now, if I'm a student of the market and I pulled up that FMLS every single day, I probably know that that number just did a massive increase. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is your area that you're This is my about. area that I, this is my personal FMLS. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I set my market watch up. Um, I watch about two different areas, two to three big areas. That's where our teams work. Okay. So I'm kind of watching probably a bigger scope than you might be watching, but um, what I'm looking for in guiding my team and their expertise knowledge is the fact that we've got 1,088 new listings on the market. But here's my really concerning piece. Back on market is 244. That means 244 homes expired or withdrawn for whatever reason and have now re-entered the marketplace. So what that tells me is we've got stuff that's suddenly starting to not sell. Well, with that stuff, that could also be failed 
uh, fail a contract. Yeah, like I just experienced that. Um, Absolutely. But when I see those numbers start going up and down, and I see that my pendings is about 1,076, so in the last three days we've also had a lot go pending, I start to see that the buyers are out there, they're active, and people are putting their homes back on the market. Expired is 160. That number has gone up. 45 days ago when I pulled this up, my expires were only like 95, 96. Well, now we're up to 160. What does that start to indicate to me? We've got some homes not selling. What's my first thing that I look at with that? Price. 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 Now, when we talk about pricing your home to sell, and I know what we're really talking about in this class is how you're going to <coughs> write a listing contract for your seller, but should I know that stuff going into it? Yeah. yeah. Because you know the first conversation I'm going to have with my sellers, hey, Mr. Seller, this is why we can't overprice. We have more and more homes suddenly not going under contract. Joanne, do you feel like it comes at the end of the month, like typically when they have, when they Yeah, you will see them at the end of the month because people tend to write their contracts to end at the end of the month. So you will see spikes then. Mm -hmm. But like today or in the last three days, we're not really at the end of the month yet. That first week of the month, your that number is going to go up, and you should expect it. Agents, for some reason, will always like they'll set everything to expire on the 30th of the month. Just something we do. I don't know, but yeah. But if I'm watching that, I can tell my sellers. You know, 45 days ago when I looked at this, we only had about 90 something in, in the expired list. Well, what does that mean for you? We have more houses not going under contract. You can't overprice. So let's talk about your price. Because sellers still today seem to sometimes think that they can just put their home on the market for what they want out of it. And at the end of the day, they can only sell their home if there are enough buyers out there to absorb <coughs> their home. And buyers have gotten smart. And That's they should. A hard conversation that you have with them initially, right? Yeah, yeah. You do that at the kitchen table when you're doing your listing presentation to them. Um, but they all want out of their home what they feel that their home is worth. And at the end of the day, it still doesn't matter what they think their home is worth. It matters what the buyer thinks their home is worth. So when you've got some numbers behind you in black and white, it helps you kind of get to that point. All sellers think that we are underpricing their home. It's just a natural thing that they think. They think we're going to price it at 200 but they want 250 out of it, and we're doing it 200 just to sell it faster. It's, it's the wrong mentality, and sometimes you have to work them around to the right mentality. Yes? Are you, do you just have these numbers with you by the time you get there, oh, or are yeah. you pulling it while you're there? I will actually pull it live while we're there, but I will also have something printed out for them. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. You always want to leave them something, but show them live data while you're there. Gotcha. So if you've got your laptop, what I want you to do right now is go into your FMLS, and let's start looking at your market statistics, because that's the first thing you're going to look at before you price your home. Before I ever price a home for someone, I'm going to start pulling out my market statistics and find out what's going on in the area. So how do you build a, you going to show us how to build a yep. church? Yep. So. I'm very hands-on, by the way. I believe you should get in the systems y'all are using when I teach. So if that's it's rocketing in one's world, just let me know. <laughs> so I live in a subdivision called Creekstone. And I actually did a listing presentation um, two nights ago for some one of my neighbors. So we're going to kind of use her as a, a guinea pig. I'm going to immediately go into my withdrawals, my sold, my pendings, give it all to me. I don't particularly want to go six months back. Why? I think in the market we're in, you don't need to go six months back. But you make an assumption that it's been sold. Obviously, Creekstone's a big subdivision. It is. So if you're in a smaller one, I'll show you that too in just a second. Well, my, my point is, if you're in a smaller subdivision and you don't go back 365 days, you don't have anything. You go out. Cast your net wider. Go to the elementary school. Why? People People buy within school districts. So if you're in a subdivision that is too small for you to pull stats on because there's not been enough sales, <coughs> pull out to your local elementary school. And if you still can't find it, go to your middle before you go back in days. Because my appraiser's not going to care what happened 365 days ago. 
you so you know your market pretty well, I assume, and you know every subdivision within a mile radius, right? Sometimes. And you know some of the subdivisions of the houses that are in that subdivision are not comparable to Creekstone. Correct. So why wouldn't you just put Creekstone, comma, flat shoals, comma, whatever, of the subdivisions that you know are comparable? Because first I want to see what is out there in the elementary school district that a buyer might be looking at because I can't always guarantee. Yeah. And well, then I start marrying them. But that subdivision is going to be in that elementary school district relatively <coughs> I would rather see everything. <coughs> and then if it's too much, start narrowing down my particular subdivision. So you don't think, uh, well, pending, pending and sold in the last 90 days is too narrow? Because um, it's only 90 days. So you're not real. I mean, if you're only doing eight. They got that many in that subdivision. That's amazing. Well, no, these aren't. Hang on. I gave you the point. That's kind of a pretty narrow, especially if you're looking in the winter time. I mean, past 90 days, even that's a boatload right there. Yeah. So this is a bigger subdivision. There's 325 homes in the subdivision. So it, it does allow me a little bit more flexibility with my days back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still going to keep it within 90 days unless there's literally nothing. And then I'm going to maybe extend my days or send out to the elementary school district. But if I can pull up enough information in the last 90 days, because really you... Everything you do is about on a 30 to 60 day cycle, right? Buyers change what they're buying, mortgage rates are going to change, the season of year is going to change about every 90 days here in Georgia-ish, so they tell us, but it didn't snow yesterday. Okay. So I like to keep it at 90 days. Yes, you can play with it if you need to. This is just how I start the process. If I've got enough data, then I don't need to go past 90 days. In the last 90 days, one, two, three, four, five homes in Creekstone sold. A whole bunch came off the market. Okay, it's January. I bet they came off end of year. Now they're going to wait for spring to go back on. That kind of makes sense in my head. Only one went pending, but we have nine homes active. And only one went pending. So that tells me in this subdivision, we got to get real serious about the price of the home and the marketing of it. Why? Because it's competing against nine others in the subdivision, and of those nine, every 90 days, only one's going pending, right? There's yes. $400,000 spread. Yeah, there is. And so that's where I start learning how to price my market. Now, the next thing I go and look at, just for kicks and giggles, I shake it all, and I ask for a quick CMA. This is just me getting started. Because if you can price a home for your seller in five minutes or less, I will wager you didn't put enough thought into it. So when I get started, I look at how many listings, there's nine. The average, there's six bedrooms, five and a half baths. They were built around 2005. And you're looking at about a million dollars. For pendings, you're looking at 839,000. So what does that tell me right there? Yeah, the lower price point is selling, the higher price point isn't. And you had several, obviously, with uh, reduced pricing and stuff on your mm -hmm. previous page. Total days on market, here's one of those numbers I'm really going to start looking at. These homes have been on the market anywhere from 26 days to 145 days before they sold. Now, you can look at that and say, okay, but in a million dollar price point, it does take longer to sell. You are correct. But you can also look at that. That is one of those important numbers I'm going to print out and bring to the table with me when I'm pricing a home for my seller. Why? Because no I need to set expectations reality. for my seller. You may be here a while. So don't look at me in 30 days with hubby dog eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's just only so many people that can spend with what you're asking for your home. And we're going to go and look at one at a lower price point, too. But that's where I start when I'm pricing my home. And that's only the, the beginning point. But now I've got a basis to start off with, right? So the quick CMA is the fastest way for you to start looking at quick and dirty what's happening in the subdivision. Where do I start? Then you start diving further and further in. And I'm going to show you how to use your absorption analysis to really get there. But I'm going to give you an activity for a couple minutes. Pull up your FMLS, 
think about a subdivision that you maybe want to work in or you do work in or maybe you've had an appointment with recently and let's let's pull up your quick mar market statistics and see what you guys are finding. <laughs> Yeah. How so many miles question you for you. Like so I'm that. actually there. I was kind of doing as you go. So I'm in the where it says select the CMA contact. Uh huh. So I did that, and then where do I go from there? It's kind of like. Oh, that's if you want to send it to someone. Okay. Well, so okay. back out. Where? division in FMLS and there's just not enough data, cast your net wider. Go out three miles. Go to the local elementary school. Go back 30 more days on your search and start over. But keep doing that until you get enough data to look at. What's enough? I like 15 to 16, 15 to 20 to look at. Um, I really do. And here's why. And, and you may not be looking apples to apples at a subdivision initially, but what you're looking at is if you, you know, if the home you're looking at is in a subdivision that typically sells in the 400,000s and you pull everything in the local elementary up and it gives you nothing else in the 400,000s, well, you know you're the only game in town at that price point, right? So that may cause you to be able to price a little bit higher. If you pull up 15 subdivisions in the elementary, all in the 400000 price range, well, the homes may not be identical, but guess what? The buyer's seen them all. So they are your competition. What if, what if it pulls up too many? Narrow down. <coughs> so Start picking out the subdivisions most likely to be like yours. So how do you Homes know? built around the same age. You know, if, if your home was built in 2005 and it's pulling up stuff built in 1978, ditch those. So how does it reflect information where, uh, say for example, a home was on the market for say 90 days, taken off, relisted, would that show in the total days on market, will it show basically that mm -hmm. it's relisted and it's on the market now for making up five days? It'll skew those numbers. So, so it'll be showing five days in the market, right? Yep. At, potentially at a new price. Potentially at a new price. Right. Okay. But you know what that tells me is now my seller's gotten serious that seller got serious and finally figured it out. Yeah. Or they did their updates or, you know, whatever they've done. Got it. Yep. And uh, why do you pick an elementary school instead of a high school? Sorry, what? Why do you pick an elementary school instead of a high school? Just radius. Your elementaries make up a much smaller section of your high school. And so typically if, if someone's looking, yes, they look in school districts, but that's where I start to cast my net a little bit wider. And if I still don't have enough, I might go to the middle school and then the high school, but I start with my elementary to see if I can cast my, my net just wide enough to get enough information. So they don't have square footage on here, right? No, but you can add it in. Where is it? Where is it? Y'all, uh, have y'all seen that? No. Okay. Uh, when you pull out the CMA, mm -hmm. do you also uh, consider the new construction compared with the new construction in the same order? Nearby in the same neighborhood. Um, so you're going to go back to like this stage. Right mm -hmm. Go down and come to the bottom. Uh -huh. So what I'll start doing if I need to narrow down. Now you can't pull it up on your Quake CMA, but you can add the column of square footage. Mm -hmm. So I'll start doing that. Yeah. Okay. So you can add the column of square footage. When I do it, I also do square footage source. Because tax records is one thing and the homeowners are totally, totally different. different. But this will give you a good idea to start with um, just to kind of see what kind of square footage is stuff is selling for. 
and you can start taking stuff off your list if you want to narrow down your quick CMA. But that's where you start with your statistics. So what are you guys seeing in the areas you're pulling up for your statistics? What are your days on market? Come on, I give you homework. Did you get there? I can't pull it up on the phone. That makes sense. I don't think I'm pulling up right now. I'm not sure why. I'm just pulling up multiple subdivisions. That's okay. You just need to narrow your search down. Mm. You might want to narrow it down. Go back to like 90 days. Narrow it down. Because that's comparable. Mm-hmm. And that'll give you a little bit less. Does that only show that when it's sold? Yes, they only show that because really you don't know what total days the market's going to be when it's just active or pending. Yeah, I was just thinking they have a running total. Like if you pulled it today, it might show 60. If you pulled it a week from now, it might be 67. So, so Joanne, when you when you get ready to go talk to your buyers, you already have your pre-package, your listing pre-package together, and you have this information in there to leave with them. But when you get there, you pull it up and say, this is what I'm finding in your subdivision. I do. I pull everything Here's where you should price your property, and I can show you the stats right here. Absolutely. Number of properties on. Yep. Okay. Now, what you're going to do next is you're going to pull the top three most likely to match your home that you're going to talk to them about, right? Now, here's why I also pull my stuff. I bring my laptop with me, my Surface, and I, I do it live because no doubt every time you sit at the kitchen table with your seller, they're going to know everything about their subdivision because they've already pre-stalked it for you. And they're going to they're going to start pulling stuff out about homes that you didn't print out for them. Right? So you want to be able to go ahead and look at it. But, so the home that I'm, that I was pricing last night is in is not on any, it's, it's on Hermitage Drive. So I looked at that one. And it's the ne it's actually next door to this one at 759.9 on Hermitage Drive. And you know so, well, she knows what they pay. Absolutely. <laughs> so, neighbors are very nosy, folks. And Zillow makes it very easy. And Realtor.com makes it very easy to be nosy. And, and they will always know what's going on. So you have to expect that your seller is going to have already pulled their own version of their comp because they're going to look at you and say, well, you did. my house looks better than this because da 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 Okay? 
So that's where you also have to know what sells and what doesn't sell. Or you'll let the seller sell you on their price point. <laughs> okay? But you're also doing that because, you know, you would have chosen that one anyway because it's on a lower end of the fence on pricing, and then you would have chosen something higher as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if they were comparable, you want the low and the high. Now, I'm going to go in immediately on this one and say, well, 39.94 square feet um, is really off for the rest of the square feet. So I'm going to assume, because I did click further in and see that it did have a basement, I'm going to assume that they're not counting basement square footage in this, because again, Georgia's tax records aren't always accurate, right? We already talked about that. And, and I'm going to assume that that's an anomaly, because if everything else is up at seven and eight and 9,000 square feet, why is this one only at four? Is it really the gnome house of the, of the neighborhood? No, they didn't pull Probably not, not the mushroom. So it's probably they didn't pull in square footage for the basement. Now, quick question again. Because we were we, we was a little bit behind. You said you select the top three. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to take three comparables in from the access. from from my list. I'm going to print three out. So you have a high, low, and a medium. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. But I've already talked to my seller before I walk in. Do you have a basement? Okay. Is it finished? What kind of finishes have you put in it? I'm just prepping myself to be at your service the best. Talk to me about your home. Have you done any updates on it? Is it still the original carpet from when you moved in? What's your favorite piece about a home, about your home? What do you think will attract the buyer the most about your home? And I'm gonna ask all of this before I even walk in the door. Why? Because then I'm gonna do a better job pre-selecting my comparables. Because if I start going through each of these and realizing they're not even close to the house that I'm gonna go look at, I don't need to pull it up as one of my three. So first I'm going to go through my first active. Now I had already talked to my owner. She has an unfinished basement, small backyard, and she faces the main road in Princeton. No pool. Okay, so I already kind of have asked her these questions. So when I'm going through, I'm going to look at this one, and I'm going to say, okay, well, it has a basement. It is finished. It's probably not a good comparable, but I'm, I'm going to keep it on my radar. Um, it has... One to two acres, so it's a bigger one. Oh, it has a pool. She already told me she doesn't have a pool. This is not a good comparable for us. Arbor Valley. No pool. We're getting closer. Basement, finish, may not be a good comparable for me. That one doesn't even have a photo. Good grief. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I didn't get anywhere. No pool. Okay, so this one may be when I come back to. I do a lot of cast the net, narrow your net. Creek Tree Lane. Let's see. This one's got a finished basement, but no pool. Okay, and it's 979. Now, keep in mind, I'm really heading towards what's going on at the 759 house and I want to see if we are dramatically above that price point or dramatically lower or right at that price point. Why would I do that? You want to sell the house. I want to sell the house, but you know what I know about buyers? They want they want to get a deal. If your neighbor is at 759, they're going to want you to prove to them why you need more than that. So what I'm really doing when pricing my home is trying to prove to myself before I walk in the door if that home should be more than that. Because I cannot sit a home at a million dollars and price it at a million next door to a 759 home unless there's a dramatic difference in those houses. Make sense? Mm -hmm. If I walk in and that home is very similar to my 759 listing competition, I can't price it a million. But I need to be ready to show my seller that. Because your buyer, if you overprice your house, you just help your neighbor sell theirs. Oh. Every day. And I will use that script every day. If you price it too high, you just help your neighbor sell their home faster. Because buyers like a bargain, right? They want to get the best value for their money. So they're going to go in and guarantee folks they're going to make an appointment to see both of those houses. So they go in to see that house at 759 and they're going to walk next door to my listing. If I'm pricing a million dollars just because you can get a million in creek stones and mine isn't a million dollars, three hundred thousand dollars better than the one next door, I just sold that house for them. 
And that's why you start pull your comp. So I came down here and I looked at my competition. Brick front. Looks like it's got some fairly updated painting, but I'm not so sure if those hardwood floors are doing any good or not. Um, so I'm going to start to look through, oop, it's got the, the nicely done covered ceiling, so that tells me it's got an office area, okay, oop, yep, good bookshelves, nice open floor plan, potentially outdated light fixtures. The kitchens, hands down, are one of the biggest hot spots for your buyers. You have to know that as a listing agent. Because if your buyers are seeing everywhere else that they're looking at this price point, brand new, updated, fantastic kitchens, the Mac Daddy kitchen, and they walk into yours, what are they immediately going to do? Ask you for a price reduction. Mm -hmm. So are you doing your seller any good to not know that their competition has updated kitchens or not? You're not. And that's why you have to spend some time and dig into what you're doing. So I'm going to look at this and say, well, the kitchen's not really updated. It's pretty standard for an older Creekstone home. we got a keeping area with a fireplace. What I'm really hunting is that almighty basement. Okay, there's your master bedroom. Nothing spectacular about it. There's your, there's your master bath. Nothing spectacular about that. Okay, now I'm starting to see why it's the 759 when other stuff in the, in the subdivision is 900. It's not updated. It's not been updated. <coughs> was that the basement? No. No, that was just the immediate room. Okay. Cute, but could need retaining. Oh, I love that. All right, so we've got a decent backyard here, but slope. Depending on how the photographer did, that's either a soccer backyard mm -hmm. or a really good photography job. <laughs> Don't know that until you get there. <laughs> now I'm going to look at this and say, okay, that's not really a steep driveway, but it's not the flattest I've ever seen. And that's the clubhouse for the subdivision. What's, All right. what's behind it, do you know? I mean, is that like... So, and I will like, say... It almost looks like a farm behind it, just in that one picture. It's actually up against um, a main road. Okay. And I just happen to know that because I know Carpenter's Road. I mean, that was just, the more you're out in your areas, by the way, the more you get to know mm -hmm. so that you can just kind of know these things off the top of your head. So then I'm going to go up and say, well, that explains to me why the neighbor is at 759, but what if I walk into the one that I'm looking at and it's completely updated? So then I'm going to go back to looking at the individual ones. Well, this one's at 880. Hang on. Let's go back first. Finished basement. Remember, the one I'm going to price is not a finished basement. Mm -hmm. No pools, so we're getting closer. Really outdated light fixtures. So, if you went into this home and you saw the light fixtures, and say it's a big chandelier, would you have the owner cap that, take that down? So Sometimes. That it, okay. Sometimes. Now, I'm going to look and notice this, the kitchen really hasn't been updated either, has it? Mm -hmm. it no more than the, the last one we just looked at. Mm -hmm. The wall paint isn't bad. We got hardwoods that look a little bit darker color, so depending on their condition, that's good. Again, we got a really outdated master bath. Okay. So this one is 880. It doesn't appear to have much more updating than the one I just looked at. I like the one you looked at better. It just has a finished face. It's a tiny backyard. Oh, I'll now we're talking. Now we have to bring in back porch. People love these things. By I way. love those mm -hmm. things. Always know what buyers will trigger. Bring in back porches are one of those things Jordan's love. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's probably a realistic view of that backyard. Now I'm also seeing something. A lake. 
Now I'm not going to give this one a little bit of credit because it's on the lake. Yeah. Because what do people also love? Lake water. water. Okay. <laughs> Got to dance. This music comes on. People <laughs> love water. So this home probably is priced <laughs> a little bit higher because it borders the lake. And which the patio. I've happened to know in Creekstone there's three lakes and so this one's going to get a little bit of a bump for being on the lake because they get to use the lake and they get to look out on water. People just love that stuff. That's probably why they have a screened in back porch or a glassed in back porch so they can sit and look at water. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to get a feel for the, the surrounding homes in the neighborhood, right? Okay. Without ever having set foot in the neighborhood or in my seller's home. Okay. Is that the subdivision lake? It is. Are they responsible for? The eight I don't know who this is, I'm just on that Yeah, just, I'm just out of curiosity because I, um, a lot of times yeah. lake yeah. lake owners are responsible for their portion of the lake and if you ever have to train it or... No, in Creekstone HOA takes care of all of it. And these are just questions you start asking mm -hmm. once you get on the market about what does the HOA take care of. So I'm starting to see why this one may have not been at the 759 price point, even though it didn't internally look as updated, it may have bumped into that 800 price point, mm -hmm. right? Because now we've given a different amenity. Right. Okay. So let's go to our next one. This may be one I would print out and take to my seller, by the way. So you're taking the neighbor, you're taking this one. Yep. You need one more. I need one more. No pool. No pool. My son's <laughs> been in the ceiling. I don't know who's talking Will you just answer it? I should, didn't I? Yeah. Who's phone is it? She, she, she's, this, no. she's here, but this is Joanne. Are you hunting your phone? <laughs> it's in the train paper. <laughs> Was it really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. dancing to it. Oh, yeah. It's a good thing. No. They told me to answer it. They told me to answer it. So I did. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, 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 I thought it was <laughs> Now, here's an interesting one. Because now we've jumped up from 850 to 924, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to look at this one, and they've done an aerial photo for a reason. It has a detached garage area. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. So we're going to look at a lot of stonework. Okay. We got some up to date paint happening. They've all had that, so congrats. We've got a pretty good little office sitting here. That's cute. That's one fireplace. Mmm, look. <laughs> Covered porch area. Now we're talking. Completely updated. Has your buyer looking at this potentially just gotten a little ping of excitement? Yeah. Yeah. That they didn't get in the other two I just looked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now what do I know if I walk into my cellar? If my immediately, right now, I can somewhat stop, right? I'm going to keep going for them. But in my head, I can stop and say, okay. If I walk into my seller's listing tomorrow, my appointment, and I walk into a completely undated kitchen area and an unfinished basement, now we have two knocks against them. No screen patio. There is no way I can go up to 924. No screen in porches, not on the lake. I can't go this high. So you just gave yourself a cap. I just capped myself out. Oh. Okay. Unless I walk in and that's what I'm looking at, then I can reassess and repull some stuff. But I'm gonna. She's already. I mean, let's be honest. She's already told me that they didn't finish the basement. They've been in the house for 15 years. Chances are they haven't done the kitchen either. I'm making an assumption. I know that. I'll own that. But I'm just gonna make that assumption okay. before I walk in the door. That's as high as I'm probably gonna go. If her house looks like this. Okay. Now I'm going to keep going. By the way, these, have, these people have a finished basement. Yeah, that's nice. Cute. Look at all these appliances. You could, I bet that they're high end. You got a little butler's pantry done in over there. We got the, that's a full keeping room, by the way. And again, the more you get to know the subdivisions you're listing in, the more you'll start to know characteristics. So I'm cheating here. I will tell you in Creekstone, at 900 and a million dollars, if you have a full, a actual keeping room, 
you're not going to get that kind of money. Creekstone homes have keeping rooms with fireplaces. This one has that. So now I also know when I walk into the home I'm going to price, I'm going to be looking to see if they have a, an actual keeping room. Not just a little spot where a kitchen table goes, but an actual keeping room. Because that's some of the things that put this home at the 924 range. You look at some of these details. Okay, well, I wouldn't put that photo on, but. <laughs> Dave? They put some time and money into keeping their home up. Terrace level build out completed in 2017. Okay, so I've got a newer basement, too. I don't have a basement that already probably needs to be redone. That's good. And it's terrace level. And it's terrace level. That's your 10K. We got right the bar there. area. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you call it the terrace level. Right? <laughs> yeah, you said that. What was it called terrace? Huh? What was it called terrace level? When it's walk out. Fancy. <laughs> it's walk it is fancier, but when it's walk out basement, um, it's, it's more of a terrace level because it's not really subterranean under the ground. Okay. <laughs> and we've got, I mean, we have full brick all around. And a nice backyard. So probably, most likely, my bottom three actually are the ones I'm going to print out and take in to my seller. Unless I get there, when I get there, I find out that she has mad out everything and then I'm going to go back. But I'm going to be very honest and say, I'm going to reassess your comps and I'm going to call you in an hour after I leave. Question. Mm -hmm. We're just wondering, so does the number of bedrooms and bathrooms have anything to do with square footage? Yes, the square footage does. <coughs> So did you filter out any of that into, before you decide a cap, are you looking at that? Mm -hmm, I am. So I'm going to give you a little bit more credit for more bedrooms and baths and a little bit less credit for less. But I'm not going to completely focus on that, and here's why. If you look at one house and, they, and they're both got 4,000 square feet, and one of them's got five bedrooms and one of them's got four, guess what? One of them's got tiny bedrooms and one of them's got big. Right. So unless you're that family that needs that fifth bedroom, hands down, what will the buyer always do? Buy the one with the bigger bedrooms. Right. It's just human nature. So I look at the number of bedrooms because I want to make sure we're close, but I'm not going to necessarily let that be my all being factor on pricing. Right. But square footage. Square, square footage, yeah, going to be. Okay. So you're, so you're working from your active. You check the square footage because you said that 39 was a little bit off. Mm -hmm. So you got to estimate. They're roughly around the same. Yep. Then you went from your neighbor and you need a medium, a high, and a low. Yep. And I want to also pull my pending. Why? Why do you also pull that your pending? I'm going to go. That's your success story. That is. Here's what I love about pending. Because I can say without a doubt, something about this home caused an offer to get put on it. And I can also pretty much guarantee you it's probably not above A24. So at this price point, with this home, with a pool. With a pool. They got an offer. The kitchen's not updated. So here's what I'm also looking at. The kitchen's really more like that one that we were looking at at 880, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there probably a reason in my head why the 880 doesn't have a contract on it? It doesn't have a pool. pool. This one does. They're similar in their updates. So, in this neighborhood, is there a community pool? Or two? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very real. <laughs> I like the way Mm-hmm. True, but we have to So, if I'm looking at this, here's, I'm also going to print this out and take it with me on my, on my listing presentation. Why? This home was about as dated as the 880 home. The 880 didn't get a contract and this one did. Because why? This, this one had a benefit. It had a pool. It's lower too, isn't it? Uh-huh. And it's a lower price point. At 824. Right? So now what am I thinking in my head? Overpriced. I had capped myself out at the 924 if I walk in with a really amazing home. And if I don't, I can't even get up to 824 
because if my home that I'm going into is also outdated without a pool and without some of the added amenities of these homes, I I already can tell you right now you're not going to get more than 824 for it. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm really setting my case up for my seller to come to their own conclusion that their price probably needs to be a lot lower. If you can set the case up and guide your seller there on their own, you have a 90% better chance of getting a list because you didn't just dictate the price to them. You, you're going to walk them through. This is what buyers are looking at in your neighborhood. This is what they're, you're up against. Would you buy this home or this home? For what reason? And I will walk them through exactly what I just did right then. Now, if y'all were going to just, off the top of your head, walk into the presentation that I did the other day, knowing that it's next door to this one, it doesn't have a pool, it's up against the main road, and it actually was a, a five bedroom, four bath, what are we thinking price wise walking in the door? And I never made my mind up going into a presentation. I just have a range in my head. Because again, I haven't actually been in there. I didn't see it. So the 759 has a finished basement? The 759. <laughs> I don't think we saw any pictures of the base. It's unfinished. So it's unfinished, no pool, and then yours, the one that you visited is unfinished, no pool, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Same same mm -hmm. number yep. of bedrooms and baths, correct? Yep. Now let's hang on for a second. You might also want to go down here to the sold in the 700s and 8s. Go look at those. No pool, finished, finished basement. Sold at 850. Looks updated. Oh, yeah. Hey, now I've got a sold comparable. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Little backyard. But this one that sold for 800. No pool, finished basement. So we can't go over eight. Bring in four. Four. Wine four. cellar. Now we got an amenity. Mm -hmm. Bring in four. Now we got another one. We got some updated painting. The kitchen wasn't up, you know, redone, but we got a lot of nice features in this house. Keeping room. Mm -hmm. Sold at 819. Did I sell this one? No pool. Mm -hmm. Finished. Basement. On the lake. You probably got to be around the 750 range. Yeah. Or slightly below. Okay. Yeah, that's a little bit below, so it yeah. would be hot. So when I got to the listing presentation, what I found out <coughs> when I walked in the door was they hadn't painted their home in probably 15 years. Inside or outside? Inside. They've done the outside, but not the inside. The floors needed refinishing. Badly, badly scraped all throughout. They have big, big dogs. Kitchen hadn't been redone. Two of the stairs on the porch, I'm going to question whether my inspector is going to let them pass or not. I mean, the house was not in great condition at all. So I walked in after looking at all this and thinking, I'm going to be somewhere between that 759 and about 810. And I walked out and priced her at 745. Hmm. Fair. Because she's got to fix some stuff. Yeah, she's got to fix some stuff. And I said, now, what you also have to understand is your buyer is going to still look at you and want you to fix stuff. Because a buyer who can spend at 745 can probably only spend up to 750 And so they're already looking at the height of their range. But we're going to mitigate some of that. Now, what was her preconceived notion? She had none. That's good. That was good. Now, her husband was a different story. <laughs> <laughs> what did he think? I'll let you know. Oh. He and I are still having chats. 
Um, she had no preconceived notion. I think he really didn't have one, but was still shocked at that kind of a price point. Now, you'll also learn in certain <laughs> subdivisions, your sellers will have a preconceived notion of what they should get just because they live in certain places. I would guess that if he doesn't have a, a, a compelling reason to move, then he won't live. They have a very compelling reason. As in separation assets. <laughs> <laughs> no preconception. But well. here's the problem. Separation of assets also means what? The sellers want more for their home. Of course. Because they're having to rip their they're not only having to pay me and a buyer's agent, they have to finish them up themselves. Yeah, there's so. gonna be somebody who's gonna basically let them or let him drive the price yep. and that's who he's gonna list with. So when I sat and talked to them about their pricing and I can pull out all of these homes that are their immediate competition. It's pretty obvious sometimes when you look at it and you say, okay, well, this one's been redone, this one's not been redone, this one has a pool, this one doesn't have a pool. You know, they can start to see for themselves and guide themselves as to where you're going with your price and why you're going. Now, here's the other little tool that I like to pull out in my back pocket. You go to report, absorption analysis. Nine out of ten agents don't even know this exists. Okay, go back and repeat again. Yeah. Thank you. You go to FMLS Home. Mm -hmm. You go to Report. Mm -hmm. Absorption Analysis. Oh. You can pull out three costs <laughs> to take when pricing your home and take them in, and the next four agents that they see will all come in with their own three, right? And some of them might be the same ones that you do. <coughs> I have, I'll go ahead and lay my license on the line right now and tell you that chances are whoever you're competing against for that listing, they aren't bringing in an absorption analysis, nor do they know how to use one. So this is a tool that you should put in your back pocket and always have with you. Why? Because we're going to go back to that concept we talked about at the very start of class. We talked about market statistics, <laughs> days on market. <laughs> what can the market absorb? How many buyers are out there buying homes in your area? You can pull it out by zip code, by subdivision. You can go one month back, three months back, six months, residential attached, detached, whatever you need, elementary school. This is where I really do pull in the elementary and not just in the subdivision, but I'll also do one for the subdivision because I want them to see something. Freestone is in the Oh, good grief. I heard a lot of elementary folks. <laughs> How many months back do you go? I go two to three. Creekstone's in the Shiloh Point Elementary School District. I'm going to go, I'm going to start with two months back. Although at that price point, <coughs> let's go three. I'm going to run the report. Again, math doesn't lie. So when your sellers look at you and say, but my bill investment says I should get 900000 and I'll just sell it in 10 days, math doesn't lie. One of the great things, love it or leave it, about FMLS is that we do have to pay them and tell them every time we sell a home, so they do run statistics. Okay? Here's the best thing I can look at right now. I can say, Mr. and Ms. Seller, I'm looking at pricing you anywhere between $750,000 and $800,000, which falls in this bracket. Now, when you get up in the higher price point, do I need to flip over? No, I don't. They start making the brackets a little bit bigger. But I can look right here in this elementary school district where your buyers are most likely shopping and say between $700 and $799, there's roughly three homes on the market. The average days on market is 82. Our average sales price to list price is 96%. So we don't need to overprice you. Why? Because we're going to probably get within 96% of our list price. Months of inventory is one month worth of inventory in that price point. Now, what's so great about this? If we were borderline talking pricing with my seller, and I'm looking at maybe $6.99 to $7.10. And I can look and say, well, in the $6.99, there's four months worth of inventory. There's a lot more on the market. 
I actually might be inclined to bump them up a little bit to that next price point. There's less, there's less out there on the market. And they're both moving pretty quick. And they're both moving pretty quick. But if we were looking between 790 and 800, it also makes my case for keeping them at 790 versus going to 800 because I know the difference between one and two months worth of inventory doesn't seem like a lot, but that's 30 to 60 more days that you're going to sit on the market waiting on your buyer to show up, right? Mm -hmm. This is fantastic, by the way. <laughs> I think it took me six years in business before someone told me about this. Well, thank you. <laughs> yep. Now, average the market is, is lower at 800, and I can probably make a good educated guess because I'm a smart agent. Um, in the 800s, they probably renovated their homes. In the 700s, they're selling it not renovated. Mm -hmm. What do people like to do? Buy them already done. It's the easy button. And that's where you have to get to know what buyers are looking for and what their thought process is when you're also looking. You have to know the buyer side to be a great listing agent. Because the truth of the matter is, and here's the conversation that I have with sellers all the time when we're talking about pricing it right. If you look at a home that needs a lot of renovation, you automatically think, oh, well, I'll just price it a lot lower and that'll, that'll sell it. But you have to acknowledge who your buyer is going to be. Your buyer is going to walk in and not necessarily have the cash to renovate it. So you may sit on the market longer anyway because you're looking for the buyer who can get a mortgage for your home at your price and have the cash to do the renovation. Because cash, radio in the kitchen takes cash. you got to strike a check. Also, Todd, so I'm, I'm gathering and stuff when you basically show this to this person, it wasn't just about the money, it was probably about time. Time. So. And my conversation now when we talk about pricing the home goes a little something like this. Hey, Mr. and Ms. Seller, if you'll spend $30,000 now and renovate your home, I can probably get you, and I'm going to pull out this other comp, more in the 825 to 850 range, and we're going to actually sell faster. Right, so I had a similar situation and stuff, and um, they elected to spend the money. But that being said, I listed the property while they were doing the work. Now, that's a personal decision as an agent. I won't. Right, I get it, but I was under yeah. contract within two weeks. Right. And it just depends to me on how fast that work can get done. If it's just painting, that's one thing. If it's like a major <coughs> no, it deck renovation. Yeah, it was, it was deck yeah. and it was all. Buyers out. like it already done. Right. But HGTV has killed us in that sense. They do. They walk in and think it should be done already. What's the difference between the average days on market and the average total days on market? Um, total days on market and days on market, I believe, is when they're looking at how many days it took to get a contract versus close. Okay. So the total is closing <coughs> and the first one is contract. Yep. You're awesome. And current, act current active is what? Um, number of properties. Number of properties and the A status currently available. And then what's the, uh, uh, that's active. So currently there's two, two active. Mm -hmm. And then on top there were three sales. And then the, on top, first line, number one. Yeah. Resident, you know, detached yeah, sales. three so sales in the last three sales. Three months. Okay, three sales, days of market 42, total days, got it. Now here's what I'm also going to use this for. And again, when I go on a listing presentation to price a house, like I don't just walk in there on the fly. Like, I really thought about this because these are things I talk to my sellers about. When I'm, I don't just slap a CMA in front of them. Anyone can hit the button and hit the quick CMA, right? And there's 84,000 licensed agents in the Atlanta area. Don't be one of them. <coughs> just slap the quick CMA. Um, here's my other thing I'm also looking at. I'm hunting a buyer for your home, right? At this price point, what do most buyers probably have to do? sell their home. What's the most likely price point move up that can go into your home? If I'm encouraging them at around the 750s, it's anywhere from 450 to 600, right? So now I'm also going to use my absorption analysis, just a different version of a CMA. Why did you say right? You, you did the numbers in your head. Your because problem? most buyers move out of a 450 to a $600,000 home, the next pop up that they do is about a 750 or above. And you just know I just know that from your experience. But if you don't know that, go ask other agents in your office. 
Oh, I get, I, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> so now I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to when I'm pricing this home, I'm also going to take into consideration in this elementary school district in the 450 to six range, there's a lot of homes worth of inventory. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell me? It might take longer. To sell it may take home. longer to sell your home just because we're waiting on them to sell theirs. So, Mr. and Ms. Seller, are we going to price it $759 or $750 or $745? Because if it's not going to really make a difference in your bracket, but we're waiting on someone else's bracket to be able to move into yours. That's good. That's really now I've won the listing. Because mm -hmm. I am thinking through not only pricing their home, I'm thinking through their potential buyer, and guess what the other agent they're talking to is not doing? Uh, giving a crap about that. You've already done all your homework before. And do I look like the expert? Yes. People hire who they trust. And you can more often get them to price it right at the lower price point when you can point that out. Because if I'm struggling to get him to go from 775 to 745 because there's a $30,000 difference, but I can show him the months on market, and I can show him who's moving into his home. I've got a much better chance to get him to price it right at the beginning and not six months down the road. But in your market, and we'll use that subdivision as an example, what's it called again? Creek Creekstone. Creekstone. All right. So people that move into Creekstone, are they moving in from surrounding area or are they coming from Buckhead out? They're coming from Buckhead out. But so therefore the numbers that you just threw out don't pull water. They do because the ones that go in from um, Buckhead out are, or Buckhead out are generally also staying in the private schools and I pulled up the elementary schools and so we're also getting a lot of people who are moving up in the, within the area. Wouldn't, well I, I guess you can't do it on this report though. But you could pull up an absorption analysis for Buckhead exactly. out and do the same thing. Exactly. And show them both. Right. I got, a lot of, I got a lot of buyers waiting on someone else to buy their home before they buy yours. Right. So it's going to help me price your home correctly the first time, not six months down the road. I also use this really heavily. I pull my own stuff. I will CMA myself, by the way. I'll show you all that in a minute when you're pricing your home. Um, if you run your CMA against the stuff you've sold and you can show that where you price it sells at an average at or above that 96% sales price to list price, you also just gave credence to yourself when you're pricing your seller. Mm. So now they know you're not just walking in and saying, I just want to price you low to sell you, or I'm overpricing you. I'm not I'm not willing to take your home overpriced, and here's why. Or if you know who you're going up against, you run it against your competitors. All day. Mm -hmm. All day, every day. <laughs> really? Like, what are you thinking? Got that look on your face. Uh, what is what? You got that look on your face. Like, no, you I, I really am impressed with the um, going and after the typical buyer and running that absorption analysis. Mm -hmm. I, would, I wouldn't have thought of it. <laughs> you will now. I will never not do it again. Mm -hmm. When I look, and this is where, and I was very honest with Stacy when she asked me to teach at night, I said, I'm going to go off the material, but I'm going to tell you how I really do it. Because what I have found is most agents have no clue how to use FMLS, how to truly pull up a CMA, paid. and they'll do a quick CMA, and then they walk into your seller, and then they want to focus on everything else. Right? I walk into my listings presentation, I kid you not. Mr. and Ms. Seller, nice to meet you. I'm doing Bolt with the Bolt Group. Other than price, what do we need to talk about today? You say it every time. <laughs> because I want to know what their hot buttons are because I can address those, but if their only hot button is price, every seller, hands down, wants to know what you're going to price their home at. So we all know that that's going to have to be discussed. Let's just throw it out there. Other than that, we're going to get to that. What do we need to talk about today? Because the, the agents that walk in not confident in their CMA have to focus on everything else. And the agents who walk in super confident in their pricing can focus on everything else. Does that make a difference? Does that make sense? So obviously you're waiting to the end to talk about it. Yeah. But isn't it killing them? No. Especially I've already addressed the fact that we're going to talk about it. Especially the husband that you just met last night. He wanted to know that when he walked in the door. Yeah, but I told him we have to talk about everything else first. Okay. And he I like to let candy out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least he joined you. Because I also acknowledge to him. This is super important to you. It's probably the most important thing we're going to talk about, so I don't want to fly through it. 
since you have both parties there. Mm -hmm. I don't do a listening presentation without it. terrible. I, I hear you, but that was not fun. No, no. You know. It's still a good market, though. It's still a good market. <laughs> but I also am very firm in how I do things. Like Firm, yes. Both parties need to hear me as I do your CMA. Both parties need to hear this. I'm not going to do this separate. Now, if you're divorcing and we need to close you in different rooms, I'll do that all day long, but you're going to hear me both up front because I don't want someone misinterpreting something ever. So if your one seller says, well, I can meet you today at 4 and then my husband can come in tonight and meet me. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll do this when you're both available. I'm good. I can wait. Because I need you both to see this. I don't want wifey to go back to husband -y with a 750 price, she said, well, she's going to sell her home for 750, and he smokestack starts coming out of his ears because he thought 850, and she can't explain to him why. But see, if I'm in front of you both, I can generally show you all the actives, everything your buyer is looking up against, why I pulled the three I did. But if you need to look at different ones, we can look at those and the absorption analysis. I can generally get you there without you even realizing it was me. Most of the time, my sellers will have already gotten there in their head, and they just may not want to admit it out loud. Now, are you focusing on the, the bottom, the total, total? Because I know you got two areas there. Yes. It this one. Um, it's a big subdivision. It's a big subject, but it's all in Charlotte Point is in 221. FMLS will pull 222 because it's also looking at your immediate next to you competition. Yeah, because you pulled by by. Um, I pulled by elementary. elementary as opposed to this subdivision or Correct. zip code. You can pull by high school, you can pull by the specific subdivision. So is it better to pull by a school or if you're if you're selling the subdivision, would you actually use a subdivision or did you is it better to focus on the elementary? I will sometimes pull them both mm -hmm. and have them ready to take both in. Because okay. especially if it's a huge subdivision, like if I looked at that and there was twenty five homes at the seven fifty range I might want to pull just the subdivision because it will really show you the total picture right. of that subdivision. But there weren't, so I just pulled the elementary because what I want the, my seller to understand when we're talking about that price point is your buyers are not just looking in Creekstone. You may live in Creekstone and it's the best thing you've ever seen, but your buyers are going to look at all their options. So what are all their options? Okay. okay. And that's when I talk about casting the net deep and wide is you want to show a seller not just the CMA from within their subdivision but what else their buyer might be looking at. And this will pull, uh, you can also pull like new construction. I may not pull new construction in when I'm doing the actual CMA, but I will pull it in in my absorption analysis. Why? Because buyers really like toilets that no tushy has ever touched. So if they can buy your new construction at the same price as your resale, they're going to buy new construction. So we have to count them in. To me, pricing your home to sell isn't as easy as just glancing at a, mm -hmm. an FMLS printout and saying, oh, you should clearly be priced here. you got to really think about what's happening in your market. And that's where you got to know your market. So you're spending about 45 minutes an hour to put this together? Oh, yeah. Before I walk in the door. In addition to your listing packet? Yeah. Well, my our packets are just like, just walk out the door with them. They're pretty ready to go. And then you just add this? You were just adding those in. Gave us a lot to think about. We got a lot more hours left too. I'm not mm -hmm. done. But I will give you a 15 or a 10 minute potty break if you need to take one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was like, well, if you want to talk some more, I don't wait. Can we pause the video? Is that okay? Am I allowed to give them a bathroom break? Absolutely. We'll be back. You two, Lynn. Maybe we
and that's when I start talking about average closing costs. But not when I'm just talking sheer pricing about. Yes. What What did you mention about 450 to 600 range? You You're showing them that those homes in that price range are on the market longer. Mm -hmm. No, I was showing them how many were how in that many? price range because those sellers in that price bracket are the ones most likely to buy in the 750 price range once oh, they sell their home. Once they sell their home. Yep. They're going to be the ones to buy your home. Yep. Moving on up. Well, the, the person selling a 250 home isn't going to jump. No. So, so you have to look at the next bracket now. The next bracket. Yeah. I'm going to grab them really quick, too. Wednesday after graduation. Right? Um, Ten Lizzie's. Oh, fun. Yeah. Okay. Right after your test or whatever you guys do. Yeah. We're going to take you over and celebrate. Have a uh, adult beverage and uh, a taco. A taco. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it on your calendars. Don't forget. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we can do it twice, yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Hey, every Wednesday is good for margarita. I, you know what, margarita Wednesday. Every Tuesday is good for margarita. I think Wednesdays are good for margarita. But we're not going to strip clubs, right? We're just going to end in the middle of the night. Margarita for what? No, 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 no. I'm down. Any day that ends in Y. There you go. What kind of contracting do you do? Ooh, disaster restoration is where I kind of, you know, do most of my stuff. But I'm also... You know, I have a, a network that I just constructed and stuff in reference to you know, renovations for lists. And so some of those are part of the process now, but there's a lot of disaster restoration, fire, water, smoke, um, <coughs> hail, wind, tree strikes, that kind of thing. So I have a lot of insurance work that I do. <coughs> like yesterday and stuff, I had to. Go close and or you know close down two projects, organize two more, and then I had to go look at properties and measure and stuff like that and estimate. <laughs> Very cold day. I'm calm. Yeah, yeah, that's just brilliant. Yeah. But I'm but I'm kind of manipulating <coughs> the schedule right now because you know 
I need to get through this for my CE and that kind of thing. So uh, I try to hone it down into just a couple of days because if I get to the spring, I'll be, I mean, I'll be even busier than I am. You know, but I mean, I eat all day, all day long off the shirt. That's done at all. So what I, what I constructed was, I have a commercial vendor, I constructed, you know, and I have what we call a miner, so the miner's like a prospector. So what they do is they go look for distressed properties and foreclosures and that kind of thing, like that. So, I'm and stuff with a purchase price point on investment properties, a total estimate for renovation that you need to do. You know, I can do all the contracting on it, but I really don't care. I mean, I really don't. There's money to be made there, but I don't really care if I get it you know, on that end of it, but I can take them from the beginning. It's funny because like I was out there this, this property, I call it contract. I Everybody, uh, we are doing the office is doing a Super Bowl squares pool. Uh, the squares are five dollars a piece. Has, it, has anybody ever played this before? Are you guys it? familiar with it? You still haven't bought my my baseball. Okay. Um, is anybody yeah, so dipping yeah, around the subject matter? You went. Ah, I'm wearing my bro. Has anybody done this before? Yep. Okay, so it's $5 a square. Push them up and pick it up. That's a complete luck, okay? Okay. So before the game starts, we're going to randomly select a number of squares, 0 through 9, to go across the top. This is gambling. At the end of the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter in the game, well, it's not going to go over the score is on the leading team. Let's say you are to get what's normally the score? Well, you don't have to know. There's, there's no numbers you currently have. The person passed. So you don't know if this column is going to be like 5, 0. Wait, is that that huge? Yeah. I don't know. It's the one that but the you, No, it's simple. I need it. I've worked by two. I've worked with the new owner. Because I don't have any other out there yesterday. That's a great answer, right? I'm going to be sure to make sure you're cleaning it in order for the preparation. I'm going to create all my athletic work for that. And I'm picking my athletic work for that. So that's down the road when it's ready. And that's the day you get a letter and say we can do that. But that's like it's 10 acres. It's got the main house, which is, I don't know, 8,000 and 9,000. Well, that's great. It's got a shop. It's got a big house. You know, 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 big house
Let's see what Matt likes to do on the weekend. Let's see what Hey, this is an illegal activity. I know, right? I know. And you know what? Every time I ask him about buying, you know, my son's raffle tickets for autographed baseball, he goes, never does. You know, he's talking and talking. He's like he's skimming off the top. But anyway, it was over. I mean, I probably like Vaughn throwing up all the stucco and all that stuff. Okay, so they've already been in there for a month. And the landscaping has been going on for a month. Just to get it out of the I went over there and I did all the repairs that were necessary to clean the roof off. All right. So, well, now I'm just going to drive by. Holly, Holly, Snyder. We're back. We're back. Yeah. <laughs> Did I blow anybody's minds with that? You blew mine since you got here. Let's go. I'm telling you, it took me six years to learn of the report. I've been doing it manually. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. I've been doing it manually. I tell them to take all the data and dump it into Excel. Yeah, they do it for you. It's a little different, but that was more that saves a lot of time. Yeah, that's right. Okay. He's smart. Maybe I'll do more than one call and write. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, because there's another one that comes off now. In between pine grove and except you can only go back to the door and take right. four. So how many CEs do we need? Nine. In your first year. How many CEs? I believe twenty-four. Is it for this? We <coughs> get all our CEs from this course. You get a lot of them. Yeah, there's 25. Yeah, you do. Uh, you do. Uh, I mean. No, no, no. It's, it's whatever your first year requires that it gives you. I'm gonna uh, admit to you, it's been quite some time since yes, the ma'am. first year um, applied to me, so. This class is actually 30. I think you do get a 30, lot 30. of your first year CE, or first four year CE, pretty much just in, in your post it's, it's then, then Your post licensing is 36 hours within your first year, and then after that you have to do nine CE. It's, it's 25. That's why we're Yeah, that's new. And then I have three more. Nine, per year. Per four year. Per four year. This, this wipes out I the kind of find the great thing about Keller Williams is if you just occasionally show up for a brief CE class, like, you you will get your CE done throughout the course. Of <laughs> just occasionally show until your broker calls you and says, "Joe, you need to take license law," then you say, "Okay." Well, they allow you to cheat on the exam here. Personal experience. <laughs> Well, they allow you to cheat on the exam. Yeah. You're on video. Uh, that open book, you know. Book. I'll give the answer. Right on. They're going to record the exam, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Okay. I love it. Let's talk about some other things. How can you use some of these tools? The most important thing you can do for your seller is what? Price their home, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not always about where they want it priced, it's about where it should be priced. Why? Because you have to get one concept through to them. Mr. and Ms. Seller, I can dictate a lot of things to you. I can guarantee you how I'll market your home. I can guarantee you that we, you know, you and I can agree on what price you're going to do. I can guarantee you I'll do X, Y, and Z in order to put your home in front of the buyers that are out there. What I can never control is the actual market. I cannot at any given time magically poof buyers out of thin air and make them appear in front of your doorway. I just can't. It's beyond my control. So you and I are going to discuss how we're going to do the best we can to deal with the stuff we can't control, and that's pricing your home correctly. Another little script I like to use if you're into scripting, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone out there in the YouTube world, but um, I do say this all the time. So we're not used car salesmen, and even that model is gone and no longer applies any longer. We don't price our home $20,000 above where it should be and play the negotiation game down to, where, down to where it should be. We price it right the first time. Why? Our buyers are much more educated than they ever were before. It's why the concept of negotiating cars has changed over the last 15 years. Why? Because buyers don't just need Kelly Blue Book. They can see every insurance claim you've ever filed on a car you're selling. They can see it all. So they can on your home as well, in, in essence, with all the online tools they have available. Or at least they feel that they can. 
So you and I have got to agree that we're not going to price it $20,000 too high because we don't want to be that home. We are not in a day and age where buyers will look at a home that's been on the market for six months and get excited. They won't. Human nature looks at it and says, why has it been on the market for six months? And, and here's something I always tell my sellers, because then, then your buyer starts thinking like this. What's wrong with it? Why did nobody else like it? Am I, am I the only one who likes this home? What happens when I go to sell it? Is no one going to want it then too? And the minute they start down that road of thought in their brain, they're not even coming to look at your home. They're not. They're not walking in the door. So if you overprice it and you sit on the market too long, you're just causing the buyer to automatically hit swipe right or whatever that is as they're left. scrolling swipe left. See, I don't date. I don't know. Um, yeah, swipe left. Right up here. It's swipe left. <laughs> swipe left on your home as they go through your home on Realtor.com or Zillow or, or the Keller Williams mobile app. Let's not give them the opportunity to. We want them in the door, right? Otherwise, we don't sell homes not with having buyers walk through the house. So the other thing I'm also going to look at with my absorption reports is I'm going to pull it three months back, but I'm also going to pull it 12 months back. Can anyone guess why I would also pull 12 months back? Show a trend? I'm going to show a trend. You want to stay ahead of your market because your sellers are always behind the market. Your sellers, by the time most of them have realized that they were in a seller's market in 2017, the seller's market was already slowing down. So then you're walking in and you're already having to get them past the mindset that they should price a 250 home at 275 because they can't. Well, if I can show the trend of available inventory rising in their price point, I can get ahead of the fact that it's just going to keep rising and it's going to help me price them where they need to be and it can help me in black and white show them why. Especially in that price point 450 or lower where they do still think they're in a seller's market. Especially in that 2 to 250. They're going to look, Kat and I were just looking at this, they're going to look at you and say, no, 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 my home should be 260. Well, there's no, there's no inventory. I have finally been reading online and there's no inventory. Well, guess what? By the time they read that, that ship has already sailed, folks. Because they're just now catching up to what we do every day of our lives. Because the only time they ever go look is what? When they're thinking about selling. So if you can show them 12 months back, what you're going to help them graph out is the line of inventory going up in their price point. And the more homes on market, the more you are competing. But you're not showing a graph with this. No. I mean, you can. But I'm just saying why you would pull it back 12 months and kind of walk them through that, that process. I will walk through my sellers all day long, what happened three months back and 12 months back, because I want them to see if we've stayed steady in our months of inventory or if we've risen or if we've lowered. That helps me get them priced right the first time, not six months down the road when I don't even want them as a client anymore. <laughs> and it, again, when you put it black and white, they have a hard time arguing it. Another thing I will point out to you, don't walk into a listing presentation not having pulled up their estimates. <laughs> don't. I know. We have a love-hate relationship with the almighty Zillow. <coughs> it is what it is, folks. They have gotten the attention of our consumers. Pull up a what? Zestimate for Zillow. It's all they can see. It's all they, they see. It's what they have. It's what they will use to refute your CMA and your absorption analysis report. Okay. How do you use his estimates? If you're going to pull out the Zillow's estimate, and you should, because that way you at least know that there's a chance your seller has looked at it and that's what they think their home should sell at, you can use it in a couple different ways. Anyone imagine what those ways could be? If it's different, prove it wrong. Yeah. Figure out why it's wrong. Or here's one of my favorite ones. Show the comp. Hey, congratulations! Your estimate says 700, and I'm going to price you at 750. Rock star! Mm. <laughs> or you already know walking in, they've probably seen his estimate for 950, and you may or may not have a hard case on your hand to convince the 750 price point. It, it helps you get mentally prepared for what you may encounter walking in the door if you know what they're seeing. And the truth of the matter is, they've looked. 
They may not tell you they've looked, but they've looked. And in that scenario, would you print out that article about the guy the CEO that sold his home at 40% below his own estimate? <laughs> Yes. Or do you pull? Do you pull those estimates for the your three comps that you brought in? No, I just want to know this estimate in my head so that I know. So like we're there. They start saying to me, "No, we should price at 900." I kind of have an idea maybe where they got that from. It, it just kind of helps, you know, because you have to assume that they've done their own research. You have to kind of be ahead of the game, I guess, in that sense. But a lot of agents also want to just ignore the fact that Zillow and Zestimus exist because we all know how wrong they are. And I think you shouldn't ignore it. I think you should just be aware of it because you can use it to or to your advantage sometimes and you know, get you know help you build your case better. But your favorite one is when you walk in and the Zestimus lowering what you're going to price it for. You guarantee you're, you're signing that listing agreement. Okay, I have a good question for me. So Brandon, if I say. I want to sell a house and give you an address. Where do you go from there? Because it's not going to be in the system, right? No. So you don't know what subdivision it is? Pull up the tax record. Y'all know how to do that? From where? No. Okay. No. That's a good starting spot. Go to public record. don't know anything about the property you're going to go look at, you don't even know what subdivision it's in, you can put the address in, does anyone have an address? So where did you go, I mean, where was that? Matrix. Okay. Public records okay, gotcha. and real list. Matrix. Go to um, 184, Grayson New Hope Road. Is that one word or New Hope? Well, it's going to be two separate words. What's this we're looking at? Real estate tax identification information. So I can look and say, whoops, sorry, your mouse just took a matrix. Click on um, public records and you'll see the link. So under real is tax, when I put the address in and then selected it, I can look, the subdivision is Meadow Grove, phase one, Meadow Grove. So then when I start my process, I'm going to go into FMLS, I'm going to pull out Meadow Grove. And then I'm going to see, if I need more data, I'm going to see what elementary it's in, and then I'm going to go back and also pull out the elementary. So I just I know nothing about Meadow Grove. The elementary is in there too? No. You just go back to here and you pull out Meadow Grove and see what elementary all the homes listed are in. That is it. Start from there. You just reverse stalk it basically. Reverse if you don't know anything it. about it. Thank you. She's doing your research. Alright, this is a little monster. You're gonna click on public records. Educate. Real is what comes up. FMLS has a good training on it. FMLS has a great training on it. One oh one and two oh one. So if a property is priced too high, um, how long? Let me go back to you don't want to see the desperate when you're trying to lower the price. So what should the process be for, you know, lowering the price? So the question is, if the property is priced too high, what what the the way to go about lowering your price? Well, you have to decide that for yourself as an agent. And I know that's not the answer you want, but it is. A, how how far above where it should be priced is it? If it's too high, sometimes it's better as an agent to not take the listing. Painful as that sounds, it is very, very true. Because if you are willing to list a home that you know is too overpriced, you got two problems on your hands. One, you've already shown yourself to your seller that you may not know what you're doing. And two, you've already shown your seller that you're going to let them dictate everything. So when you do get an offer on that property, if you do, guess what's going to be even more painful? Negotiation. Negotiation. 
Because your seller is going to say, well, you let me price it here. Mm -hmm. So why should I listen to you on the counter offer? So know that walking in, if you, those, those are the challenges if you overprice a home. I mean, you can consult with them and stuff, and if you, they disagree with you, you can put in your listing agreement, and after a certain period of time, it is to be You can. Free. That's another option. You can say every 10 days, we're going to lower it if we don't have an offer on your property. You know, and that's, again, that's the personal agent preference. Some agents will take anything and go the route of lowering. Some will take it never lower, and some will be really strict on, I don't take over price listings. Sometimes it's case by case, you know, who the sellers are. Sometimes you have to lower a price while you're on the market. Why? Because the market changed. How often do you check with those that you already have on the market? We run them every Monday. So once a week? Once a week. Every Monday my office staff runs statistics on our current listings. Why? Because we want to know for our sellers what else has come on the market in their area, what went under contract in their area, and what closed. Why? Because the pendings moving to close, they probably closed last Friday, might change where my pricing needs to be. Or if I'm priced at 500000 and three other homes all at 500000 got an offer and went pending over the weekend, and I didn't even have a showing, something's wrong. Right? You want to so, call those agents. Agents. Huh? You want to call those buyer's agents and say, why didn't you look at mine? Yeah, I do. I mean, because what was it about? Do I need to change my marketing? Is my description wrong? Is my photos wrong? You know, what was it about their $500,000 homes that got a buyer in the door, much less an offer? So you want to, don't ever put a home on the market, think you priced it right, and just let it go. You want to really stay on top of it and just time block it into your calendar, however often you're going to check those things and go over them with your seller. You need to call your seller before they call you. Yeah, stay on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we tell our sellers all the time, guess what? We're going to get feedback on your listings. Trust me, I'm going to let you know when it's something you and I need to talk about. Why? Because every feedback is going to say one thing, it's overpriced. It's the agent's cop-out of I don't want to give feedback. So we can't always look at the agents telling us it's overpriced unless they're giving me the reasons it's overpriced. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk. So if I need a lower price, I'll use that as well. But mm -hmm. most often, if you price it right to begin with, you're only having those conversations if the market itself has shifted. Something's gone on to make the buyers not willing to offer as much for these homes. School districts change, a new gas station down the road gets approved, uh, mortgage rates rise, government lays off people, go on furlough, like all kinds of stuff happens. Time of year will impact. We all like to tell our sellers, oh, you don't have to wait for spring. You know, but all your sellers think they should wait for spring. Here's the other reason if you can pull up your CMA and your absorption reports, you can get them to not wait for spring. Because if I go back 12 months, I can probably pull up last spring, right? And I can also show them what? More homes on the market in spring. So, Mr. and Ms. Seller, if you really want that higher price for your home, you're better off to do it now because there's not as much competition. The flip side of that is there's not as many buyers either. But more homes on market means I can't overprice you because there's more options for the buyers. Now, knowing your area and your market statistics to me goes way beyond just knowing days on market and sales price to list price. It means knowing what's happening in our area. And here's my example of that. In Atlanta in July, do we see more houses going under contract or less? Anybody know? July. 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 Anybody know why? Vacation. Vacation. School, School starting. starting. School starts in August. Yeah. But what do we see at the end of August, early September? Vacation. A lot of properties go on mm -hmm. under contract, right? Anybody got an idea why? I studied this one. I think people are weeding out stuff, you know, trying to get their best deals after the season, so to speak, is over. They might, but I'll tell you one of the to me in my business, what the number one reason is because everyone who moves to Atlanta from up north doesn't realize we start school in August. Mm -hmm. And so then they come down end of August to go under contract so that their kids can start school when they think is right after Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And they've missed it. That's so funny. <laughs> Huge relocation opportunities if you know what you're looking at. 
So when I talk to sellers about pricing and they want to go on the market in July, we're not going to price as high as we might be able to the first week of August. Why? Because I know from 15 years of experience that first two weeks in August is when all the reload comes in. So all my people who live here that want their kids in the school zone before school starts, they've already put their offers on the market in June. They close in July. And so in July, you don't get as many buyers out as you do the first few weeks of August. It's reload. It's a reload cycle. Same thing happens, guys. For every agent out there that takes December off and November off because the market's slow, I love y'all. I pick your business up every year because <laughs> the same thing happens. The people here may not be wanting to move because they just put their tree up. They don't want to pack their tree up, but what's happening? Big corporations are moving their CFOs, their CEOs, and their key players in their companies. And they're going to move them in January because the start of their fiscal year is a lot of times happens about January 15th. So if they're going to move you in January because you're a big wig at a company, guess what you do on Thanksgiving break? You come down here and house hunt. Yeah, I'm busier right now than, you know, have been during the other months of the year. Yeah. And a lot of it's because those companies, you got to go off company fiscal years. So when you know things about our area that we live in, and you can talk about those things with your sellers, does it help you in your pricing strategies? Yeah, it does. And again, you just became way more experienced than that Palmer House agent out there. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't get that education. They don't know to think beyond the quick CMA and FMLS. If I know that a new school is opening and it may attract or, you know, it may cause a small ruckus amongst my clients, I might advise my client to wait eight months and let's see what happens. That recently happened where I live. They opened Denmark High School. Now, I know in Forsyth County how great our schools are, and I know that Denmark was not going to be a problem of a school. In fact, it's probably going to be where you wanted to move into. So I counseled a lot of my clients out of putting their home on the market because they were in the new, sk new school panic. Well, guess what? Now they've all put their home on the market anyway because they can probably move up and get a more expensive home because now Denmark High School is really sought after. But the panic wave happened when they announced the Denmark High School because you get parents who are like, no, my kid's always going to South Forsyth. They have to stay in South Forsyth. So you have to kind of know what's happening in the area you're selling in because you have to know what the buyers may be thinking. It will dictate the pricing of your home. Knowing your trends. Is gray and white still in or is it on the way out? What's coming in? What are our buyers going to be seeing? We heard Navy Blue and Gold the other day. Gold's back in. God help us all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate gold. I do too. Mm -hmm. I just got rid of all of it. Okay. Now we're back. <laughs> if you're a newer agent, or, and pardon me, I'm going to make some assumptions here. If you're a guy, and you have no clue what color schemes are popular right now because you don't pick up the magazine. It doesn't interest you at all. No offense. But, I mean... It is what it is. Go look at model homes. Spend your time there. Go to the new construction sites. Just walk their model homes. Because they are the ones employing the professional interior designers, and they're probably the ones staying on top of what the next trends are going to be. And they're already putting them in their model homes. Why? Because the buyers want what's better than what they currently have, hands down, every time. So when you start seeing all the model homes start shifting their color schemes, no, it's probably about we're about to have a shift in popularity of stuff. It's just an easy trick. Plus, you know what your competitors are. So you know if you price a home at 450 and down the street they can get a brand new home at 450 and your home needs a lot of updates, can you really price it 450? You cannot. Because buyers will always buy new if they can. You have to think that. It may not be the truth, but you have to think it. Because wouldn't you? If you go on Amazon, do you order the new book or the used book? If they're the same price? The new book. The new book. Every time, right? You have to assume the buyer is going to do the same thing. Questions? Y'all look at me like I've run their hands. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So this is kind of opposite. So say you got a seller who wants to sell, like you just said, down the street. It's a subdivision where they can buy a new home 
for maybe ten, twenty thousand 20000 more than what you was going to list their home for. Do you, do you advise the seller to perhaps rent their home or sell it as is? If they still want to buy a new home, like how do you handle that? No, I just I just advise them on the correct pricing because of the new construction down the street. It is going to pull their buyer's attention. So are we priced correctly to re-grab it as a seller, or are we just handing the new construction their buyers all day long? <laughs> Unless the seller approaches me about listing their or leasing their home out, I, that's never advice I'm going to give. So I Though I love investment pieces, I have several myself. I don't advise my sellers that they should rent their home out. Unless it literally is one of those cases where it's like, yeah, you're so underwater, there's nothing I can do. Which happens what, occasionally. What's that conversation? Mr. and Ms. Seller, I'm so sorry. I can only get $300,000 for your home. I wish I could get you more. You need three fifty. dollars Well, let's talk about why. Oh, because you owe this, you owe that. You put the, uh, Well, unfortunately, the market is what it is. I can't get you more than 300 so maybe we need to look at some other options for you. But I'm not a leasing agent, so I don't handle that. Mm. And sometimes it's better to not have a seller mm. if you can't do a good job for them. So when you walk out of your listing appointment, follow it up with a handwritten note. Just I used to carry handwritten notes. I'd have them sitting in my car in the passenger seat. I'd walk out. I'd pull into the subdivision community pool and I'd sit right there and I would have already pre-addressed it, pre-stamped it and everything and I would sit down there, thank you for meeting with me today and I'll know then whether I should write, I'm so looking forward to going on the market with you because we just signed a listing agreement or I know I gave you a lot to think about, I'm going to follow up with you in a few days to talk about it because I know what we just talked about so I know what to put in my note. The power of a handwritten note is amazing and then as I pull out of the subdivision I'm going to find my local blue box you know, mail place, I'm going to stick it in there <coughs> so that it gets to them the next day or the day after. And they love you for it because nobody does that anymore. How long do you wait to follow up? 24 to 48 hours max, depending on how the conversation went. Like if I know they're meeting with three different agents, I'm going to follow up the very next day. But they'll cancel those appointments if they like you enough. Oh, I'll offer to do it for them. <laughs> <laughs> How does that sound? Because I'm stealing all your tea. <laughs> <laughs> Price it right. Listen, listen presentation class. <laughs> Something like this. You know, you and I have talked a lot about pricing of your home, and I know that we clicked, and you know that I'm going to do a really good job. Don't you want to work with an agent who's super aggressive? Because when it comes time to negotiate your contract, you want that agent on, on your side, right? Yes, I do. Fantastic. Now, you and I both know that sometimes calling the other agents is embarrassing because you, you're going to cancel your appointment with them. Go ahead and put their cards on the table for me. I'll, I'll take care of that for you. I'm, gonna, I'm a full service agent. I'll call those other agents and say there's no need to come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> full service agent. I don't want you to be embarrassed, put off, or inconvenienced. I'll do that. No big deal. Here's the listing agreement. You work on that. I'm going to step outside and call these agents. <laughs> and what does that sound like? Super fun, actually. <laughs> 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 I'm so sorry. Oh, no, there's no need to come tomorrow at 2. Yeah, I'm so sure we're signing it right now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> what? You've actually made the call? Oh, yeah. Oh. It's so fun. I believe her. <laughs> Best phone call ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great. And then you quickly find out which agents you want to co-op with or not by their reaction. Because the agents who handle it very nice are the ones you think, bring me a buyer, let's go off, I like you. And the ones who go off the handle, you're like, ooh, okay. You know, <laughs> you're one of the 84,000. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not mean about it, you're just being polite. Same and time. Same and done. Okay. Hold on, let me read it. You got another question. Let me get it back. All right. Get it back. Anybody else have a question? Making sure I hit the points that might be on your head. All right, so we talked about pricing strategies, the factors that drive price, what sells. We talked about that. Your window of opportunity. We talked about that. No. When you're discussing with your sellers about their window of opportunity. That's really also, again, when I pull out that absorption analysis, because if their window 
we always want our sellers to price it right. Why? Because the first 30 days are critical. The longer it sits on the market, do they become the stale house that nobody else wants? Do we create an environment for buyers to say, well, why didn't it sell in six months? Am I the only buyer who could possibly like this? That's their window of opportunity. I also tell my sellers two things. I need you to understand this from a seller when we go on the market. This, these are the two things that are going to happen. I'm going to put you on the market, and in the first weekend, you may or may not get an offer. If you get an offer, that is super fantastic. It does not mean we've underpriced your home. <coughs> what it means is we priced it exactly right to capture the eye of the buyers who are currently out there looking right now with their agents. So I, I need you to know ahead of time, if you get an offer within 24 hours, it's not that we're underpricing, it's that we are capturing the buyers who are right now looking. And if you don't get an offer in 24 hours in the first weekend, it doesn't mean we overpriced your home. It just means now we're, we're waiting for the buyers to come on the market, the ones who weren't already out hot and with their agents. And generally speaking, they'll either get the offer on the first weekend or it might take whatever your absorption analysis says it's going to take. But if you show an absorption analysis to a seller and it says there's eight months worth of inventory and they get an offer in the first eight minutes, they're more than likely going to think you underpriced their home. So go ahead and have the conversation about window opportunity means if we price it right now, we're capturing the buyers who are right now in that eight month cycle of inventory, but they are right now looking. But they didn't know your home was on the market. And we didn't know they're out there. Otherwise, it might take a couple of weeks. It might take this full eight months worth of inventory that your absorption analysis shows. And we have those conversations right up front. You're setting expectations. The more you set up expectations, the more you can dictate the price of that home. <coughs> what if they're trying to sell investment properties that someone's in? How does that work? Like a rental that someone's living in? Mm -hmm. That's a whole different ballgame. You still got to price it correctly. But now you're talking about showings with renters in there, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a whole a lot of stuff. <laughs> I, told, I told my clients to get the renters out. Yeah, I mean, it's way easier. <clears throat> You're not being rude. It's just renters have no motivation to show that property in its best condition mm -hmm. yeah, or to show it at all. Mm -hmm. And they love to make up stories. And they, well, they love like the to stay at the house while it's being shown mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I mean, they... Or it changes a lot because they don't want to move. I've seen that happen. Hmm. We couldn't get into a house to see it because they changed a lot. Yep. They start talking about mold and crazy stuff. They're all kind of stuff. It's all kind of fun. Hmm. <laughs> the other thing I talk to um, my clients about when we talk about pricing your home is a lot of sellers will look at you and say, well, my home's luxury because it's like 700000 And I'm like, well, in Atlanta, that's not luxury. <laughs> that's like average. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, and so sometimes you have to pull what's on the market and what's gone pending in the entire area that they're in, which to me includes the high school. Now, now we've cast our net a little bit wider the high school to show them that while they think they're in the top 1%, they're just in the top like 25%. Because another thing that you're doing when you're pricing them correctly and setting the expectations is also alerting them to the fact that, you know, we're going to put your home on a super E key and agents are going to request a showing. But you need to do your best to be, a, you know, have that home available for the showings, but please don't expect that you're going to stay at your home or that I'm going to necessarily be there. At two point something million, yeah, I'm going to be there every time. But at seven hundred thousand, I'm going to trust that those agents know what they're doing. And sometimes you have to talk sellers off the ledge about that one. A lot of the times, the conversations I'll have with sellers are, I need you to kind of shift your mindset a little bit. The minute the for sale sign goes in the yard, it's not really your house anymore. It's everybody's house. Mm. So put your valuables up and be prepared. And don't watch them on their security cam. Yeah, we've been warned. <laughs> All right. So what I'd like to do is for us as a class to pick a property, if anyone's going on a listing appointment or Catherine, if you, Catherine, if you've been on one recently, and I think as a class, let's put the subject property up and let's pull the subdivision up on FMLS, and then y'all take 10 minutes to pull up what you would use as a CMA with your seller, and then let's discuss it. 
So I think that sometimes doing the activity is as beneficial as listening to me thought off about the activity. Can I use my property as an example? Because sure. we've been on the market for like 15 days, but I want to hurry up and get this thing sold so I can move on to the next one. So it would be really helpful. Okay. <coughs> Gardenia, G A R D E N I A. Drive. Whatever your classmates tell you. Absolutely. I love transparency and honesty. Please let me know. Alright. So we're in Ezra Church Heights. Sorry. Atlanta, Georgia, 30314. Alright, so we're going to look up Ezra Church Heights. Change it to 90. Y'all, when you're doing the church, Search, don't put road. That okay. usually is where you are in the circle or in the street. So if you got your computer, pull it up in your FMLS. That way you can play around in it. We're going to take five or ten minutes to if you were going to walk in, assume this is a, assume now this is an expired listing, and you're going to walk in, do your own CMA and price it where you think it should be to go on the market. It could be that she's spot on with her price. Or it could be that she isn't. And then I'll be here to answer questions if you've got them. So I'm going to give you all a couple minutes to work on it. Fifteen Gardenia Drive, Northwest. So did you put the, the address in that, that search bar up top, residential detached? I, I, I did. And then I figured out what subdivision it was in, and then I pulled the subdivision. Okay, so what? We'll go to uh, in a minute. We'll go to. It's like reverse prospecting. Okay, because <laughs> okay, I got like a for some reason I, I got an, an error. Maybe I just didn't write. Mm -hmm. So since it's closed, it's harder now to clear it out. Okay. Search. Girl, I was looking at this house. <laughs> well, give me your honest feedback. I would love to hear. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't get more. 
Thank you. Don't let that hold back your feedback, though. Girl, we are. Well, I'm, I'm your friend. I'm proud of you. Well, thank you. I just need this feedback. You know, people are buying and um, tearing down over in the area. It's like an up-and-coming area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people are buying lots and tearing down houses. Um, or just um, renovating the abandoned property. Yeah. This was a great case study, and it's so realistic. I live off I live off of Beverly Highway in the West Island. Oh yeah, that's not far. But I live like I so I was actually looking at two or three that I saw online that are renovated, really nice. Yeah. But the thing that person turned me off was the neighbor's house. And that's the yeah. That's what I mean. I drove to look, and then I was like, no, no, because the neighbors. And then I was nervous even to go look in the backyard, but I know the houses are beautiful on the inside because I've seen them. The cops are just all over the place, so I don't really because it's up and coming. The first thing I would do is change that first picture. It looks like it's all concrete front yard. There's a, the second picture is better. Okay. Is it where you can see more of the grass? Maybe the. Mm hmm. That, for, that second picture is really great. Oh, this house that? has really cute curb appeal. But hold on, the second mm -hmm. picture got the neighbor house in it. The I reason I did I the first one is because it doesn't show that second door, so it was looking smaller than it needed to. What about this one? Well, picture? I might go take another picture where mm -hmm. you didn't look like you have this cracked, dented hold in the concrete right okay. in the front what? of the house. Why so like crop, crop that crop out yeah. but still leave. Or that or crop that out. Okay. Oh what about a picture of the inside first? Cause I don't like that. that. I like the exact when you go well, the interior, I'm like, well, how well, ugly? What's wrong with the outside? Like, how ugly is the outside? But you got to scroll to see the outside, so you just no. I don't. I never use an interior picture first. I don't think the third picture. Is I just good. really spend a lot of time getting a good exterior shot, though. But you're right. This does look bigger, but that driveway makes me think twenty five thousand dollars of repairs that are necessary mm. right now. Okay. I would put that kitchen first. But I, li I really like the tree that's destroying the driveway. I want that in there. <laughs> and that's another thing. The, the property, because I did a survey, there's a road that is closed that leads to the other road, Spring Lane. Um, and it's an eyesore. So it's the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, and so they still haven't come to pick up the tree and remove it out the way. It's just um, the area. So, yeah, so that's another thing. Alright, are we close enough to where we want to discuss, or do y'all want some more time? We're ready. This ready. Is we fun. already started. <laughs> real projects are fun. Mm -hmm. Put this, what we all, what we discussed the last two and a half hours into perspective. And realistic, because this is where I think a lot of people are trying to target both up and coming areas, and that's where a lot of the investors are too. Mm -hmm. But how do we even sell something with the neighborhood even though we see more construction because I walked to a neighborhood to look at one and it was like four more that they were working on but I don't have that's to where knowing your market makes a difference on your price point if you know what's happening around you you can talk realistically to your sellers Mm -hmm. 
this one's probably, you don't even need to look at it because it was built in 2007, except that if we're looking at a home that we've just completely renovated, is it more like a 2007 than a 1948 home? So it was yeah. better than the 2006. And the so I'm going to leave that as a comp because depending on how much the owner gutted the inside and redid electrical and plumbing, I, it's, it's kind of a valid comp. Yeah. And one of the first things I'm going to do here is click them all, click my map. Mm -hmm. Now do I have a market condition that could dictate something? So here's my home in question. Here's the MARTA station. Everything I pulled up on this side is in the twos, low two. Everything on this side are my threes. Mm. Did the people in the surrounding communities just dictate price points? Yes. Yeah, they did, <coughs> unfortunately. Because what this tells me is on this side of MARTA, my home can go for this price. And right now, currently, on this side, they're just not getting that. They may get there, but they're not there yet. And where's the belt line at? On here. Um, so you know where it says Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. Drive Northwest? It's right there through just us. It's right there. Now what I'm probably seeing is an up and coming area that's gonna explode, but just mm -hmm. hasn't. Yeah. Yet. So my seller's gotta be the one to make it explode. Help it. But am I probably gonna get two forty seven? Probably not. Can I ask a question about square footage? Yes. Please don't fire me. Um, <laughs> so, hi, I'm Kathleen with the Bull Group. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when I go through these, we see the appraisal, squ the appraiser square footage, homeowner square footage. I know that in Georgia we don't have necessary, or we used to not, unless it's changed when I wasn't looking. Like one way to calculate square footage. So well, I don't obsessed about square footage and I tell my buyers that too like you can't it's not like price per square footage isn't no, 100%. It's not no it's not it's like it's kind of your it's really what your investment's going off of and you're when I you're pull it up here just because when I'm looking at a subject property that is really interesting because there's just no clear-cut way to price it <laughs> I'm going to start looking at other factors well what what did the market say they were willing to absorb at a price per square foot now, I'm not necessarily going to pull up my absorption analysis on this one because you're you're looking at a different type of property. You're looking at a fixer upper that was fixed in a fixer upper neighborhood. So the the available inventory is not really accurate. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I've had um, some buyer clients and stuff, and the aha moment came within the last couple of weeks about this scenario, mm -hmm. and so she cannot, like you just suggested, go through the traditional route. <coughs> so what we did is we did a two mile radius and stuff. We found two properties and stuff that were four twos and stuff within two miles. Mm -hmm. And so that's what she's doing. Yep. Um, this is your urban renewal is what it is. And this is happening in droves out yep. there. But like you could have a you could have a property on a street that's completely renovated like hers and the next ten on that street are beaters. Correct. Yeah. And so yeah. what's happening in the urban renewal is that they're buying, they're renovating to a certain degree. Correct. So she's in a conundrum right now, but there are two properties which are in the two mile radius, which is Camellia and Harwell, mm -hmm. which are fairly similar. Um, and she's kind of commiserate with that, but in this particular case and stuff, like you said, it depends on where she's in proximity wise. Um, and this is, you know, she's trying to basically set the bar and be a she trendsetter is. is what she's trying to do. So if she wants to price it to sell, in our estimation, you know, she needs to be next to, I think, Camille or Harwell, which are, are more commiserate with her. Um, but even then, they're still active. And I, you got there ahead of me, which is great. Part of what I was pointing out about the this side of Marta and the that is clearly in this instance, my elementary school casting of the net still isn't giving me a great picture. It's just not. Because I still can't in my head because if you just looked at this, 247 next to the 330 should have sold like that, but it's not. So clearly my elementary trick isn't working, and at that point I do. I go up to three miles out. Why? Because an appraiser will go up to three miles out. 
and I start pulling up the properties that are most, most similar. And how do you, how do you go out by mileage or is there, oh, within, okay, I see there it is. Okay. You pop in the address mm -hmm. and those criteria and then you go with, you click yeah. on within. Three miles out from a uh, yeah. bar when you're in an in-town neighborhood like that. And check them off with them right around well, the corner. Well, you went to Carthage, you know, there in that area. I'm very familiar with that neighborhood. In town, I would never have gone. Yeah, I, I go got like 67 matches, so yeah. that may be too much. Yeah, we got, we went to. 67 still, so I'm still going to go back and say a 4, 2 plus. Now we're talking 1,600. Why do you think it's just in the range from like 1,450 to because her square footage was in roughly 1600, so I want to see roughly the same size as the home. You don't get pretty anything smaller. Mm -hmm. No, people will always buy up. So I'm going to get the one you came up with. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't put the you criteria okay. on the bedrooms and baths like you did. And sometimes, y'all, it's a game. Yep, I went pretty generic with it. <coughs> and at that point, you may want to start looking through all the photos and just checking them out. That's what we did. What did you, what did you like? Chickamauga? Uh, yeah, we looked at a few of those. The one that just went under contract was one on Joseph E. Boone for two forty nine eight. So I considered. You know, and, and also what was concerning to me in that capacity and stuff with that, not just hers, but a litany of others <laughs> and stuff were on, you know, lower price point. So I think, you know, the prevailing trend, you know, is that people are seeing that if they just kind of wait, people are coming down in the price range. So that's not good for you right now either. You're not about to rezone some of that to five, from zone one to zone five. Right, but you still can't force it to be worth what you know sh you know you want it to be worth. So when everybody sees those those down arrows, they know it's continuing to move down. Is this over there, like in that English neighborhood? Um, it's not English Ave or Vine City, but it's in the southwest Atlanta, so it's like just the west side. Atlanta. So those two, English and Vine, are about to be rezoned for Zone 5, mm -hmm. which is the Buckhead Zone, which is probably why on that side they're more. How long have you had on the market? Um, since the 15th. So two weeks. Of January. Mm -hmm. Of January, yeah. Did you get any traffic for showing? Um, I did three open houses, had a lot of people come out. I asked for a lot of feedback. They said they loved the property, they loved the tray ceilings, blase blase. Love that it's not overstaged. Um, but it is on like a um cult not a cul de sac, but it is on a dead end street. To me I like that. It's very quiet and serene, but um I think one of your biggest telling factors when you actually just look at the sold, mm -hmm. although it's not the end all be all, mm -hmm. you're seeing price per square footage is everywhere. They're a little bit everywhere, but not many of them are quite as high as what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're as overpriced as it initially looks like when you look at Ezra, but I think that you probably need to be more along the, you know, no higher than 124 square feet, if not somewhere in the 90s. Have you so um, I'm going to go down here to this one. I used to live next door. That's Smith Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one photo. Yeah, I don't know if we were neighbors. That's my house. <laughs> <laughs> it's a duplex. So he decided to sell it. He said he was renting it. So that's kind of telling to me, too. This was a duplex. So we got eight bedrooms, four baths. We got two houses in one. Most likely going to go to an investor who's going to rent it out, right? That's mm -hmm. probably what you're hunting on your, your property. 
Well, in duplex, if you can get two renters out of one building, sold right. at 260. Oh. And you've got yours that was a duplex and is now just a bigger home, um, but still only four bedrooms at 279. This is kind of what the market says an investor would be willing to pay for it. So if you want to capture both markets, an investor and a pop, you know, possible homeowner, I, I don't think you can be above around 260. But you're going to have to watch that subdivision very carefully because I'd be interested in the Ezra. Where'd it go? Preview. I'd be interested to see what these go for. The other ones. My biggest fear for you right now is someone. What, what you also have to look at it is if this was on the market for 189, fairly redone. It needs some work on the outside, but the inside's not not a hot mess. You're going to struggle to sell almost sixty thousand dollars above that. And, and really, at the end of the day, that's, that's what it boils down to. So, isn't it? So, what, 220, you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yours would be better than mine. Mine is bigger than mine. Yeah, but I mean, you know. Yours is bigger. Yeah, but yeah. I mean. We're you know, assuming the square foot is correct. Right, but your your points are extremely well made. I mean, you know, even if the appointments and stuff are, are better at your property, you know, this is a primary residence, and, you know, you just can't. You can't get it to potentially appraise if someone's going to financing and stuff. You know, you have to basically, even if you have like an extra bedroom, that might be five to six grand, mm -hmm. you know, versus, you know, if it's final siding versus whatever, <coughs> you know, new roof, whatever. But that that's that's a whole lot to make up, you know, in, in, in square footage information. Yeah, you know, really wow me for 60000 more. And unfortunately, there ain't much we can do to Lily you now. She redid the whole inside. I know. Unless you buy the rest of the houses oh, on the street. Yeah. <laughs> she did a really yeah, good job with the exterior. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. really good, really. The exterior too. Yeah. But I think if you took this one and redid the exterior, so you added another fifteen grand to it, you're looking at the same. In a buyer's eyes, you're looking at apples mm -hmm. apples at that point. Yeah, this this and this is what somebody would anticipate as a primary. And it's not necessarily in it. I mean, if you're going to be at two fifty, it's a primary for someone. So I was going to say I'm looking at mine as a primary, not for an investor. Right, right. So, so that means the stuff that what's next door to you or two houses down, mm -hmm. you know, has to be, you know, hunting for that as a primary. Yeah, and, and that's, you, know, you also have to take into mind if the rest of the subdivision is duplexes, mm -hmm. and they are a large investment pieces. Mm -hmm. You're also hunting that person who's willing to have their primary in a subdivision full of rentals. Mm -hmm. There is a stigma. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't make it, but it is there. Mm -hmm. So I actually so think you're looking more around the 2 to 205 range. So if she went back and said 2 to 205? If I was going to show this property, yeah. This one or mine? No, no, yours. So if she went back and say she um, fixed the driveway, some things to the exterior some more. Would that bump it up to that price that she's at? It's not the house. It's not the house point. She's done it to where if it's priced right, it's the only option for a buyer. Okay. Hands down, this went. Okay. I think the problem for her right now is she's almost outpriced herself. Okay. She's almost done so much to the home that the home now doesn't meet that's, the That's diminishing return. Yeah. Right. Well, I got it appraised in October and it came in at 220 So, so we're not... That's well, awesome. I mean, and, and that, that's yeah, great, but at the same token and stuff like that, I mean, if someone does want to buy for 247 if it's not all mm -hmm. cash from their pocket, not, the appraisal's not, not going to come back that the lender is even going to approve, you know, mm -hmm. that, that price point. Yeah. So you kind of have to, unfortunately, fall in line with your appraisal. Even if, if someone's getting financing, that has to happen. Mm -hmm. And you'll find, too, appraisal, and you'll, you'll hit this with sellers a lot. Well, I got it appraised. Okay. You know the first question appraisers will ask me if I call them to go appraise my home? Is it under contract or are you appraising it for a refi or are you appraising it to put it on the market? You know why they ask that? They look at it different. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, so you they also have to educate your sellers that if you got it, if you just got it reappraised and you did it through your bank or whatever, that's a refinance appraisal which is always higher than market condition. Mm -hmm. Because the bank's really just looking at it is if you refinance it, could we get the money out of it? You've already put your 20% down. You know, or, or the refinance appraisal is always going to be higher. 
And, and with your tenure in the real estate industry and stuff, is, is, it, is it, and I seem to remember this from years past, it's no longer the case that appraisals are coming in and the unbridled honesty, they're, they're trying to structure towards the deal um, actual well, they can't go a certain amount above the um, right, contract price. Right, used to be in So even if the appraiser can get 250 if you're under contract for 200 you can't go more than like 3% above contract price. Right, mm -hmm. I, I remember it used to be the a, a FHA, I mean the Fannie Mae Right, it used to be, I thought that appraisals come in and, and sometimes at the closing table folks would get, you know, instant equity, you know, positions yeah, and they don't in their pocket, and, and they stopped that. Yeah, so. that's a government issue. And yeah. it's because of the downfall in, um, a couple of years ago, they're trying not to let appraisals go too high. So what would be the process to drop it all the way from 247 to 205 mm. <laughs> without <gotta> looking <laughs> desperate? <laughs> The only people are going to remember are the people that saw it two weeks ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're, oh, okay. you're hunting a whole different pro buyer now. Okay, got So it. if you're only going to drop it five grand, mm -hmm. and you're going to keep dropping it five grand, and mm -hmm. keep dropping it five grand, you're hosing yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take that kind of a drop, then mm -hmm. you do it. And you just do it and eat it. Okay. Um, I just don't want people to think there's something wrong with the property because she dropped it this I, down. I would say, you know, I mean, you put the private remarks for agents, mm -hmm. you know, learn how to price my home. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, know, like, I, was, I, was, I, was, I don't care. I just yeah. want the house be to be honest, sold. But if you're going to make so. that big and the price drop, yeah. I mean, the seller, I mean, a buyer can see on Zillow it did that. Yeah. But you're you're now hunting a different buyer. And gotcha. so this is the first time they've looked at it. So, so have you, but during the open houses, and, you know, during your conversations, mm -hmm. what kind of conversations have you had with potential buyers that would, that might have said, hey, potentially interest? You know, but maybe not at you know the current price. Is there somebody you can go back to before dropping it? I, I mean, call every one of them. I mean, I I call the and and this is the topic. This house. Is <laughs> I would literally <laughs> put in private remarks. Agent, the market spoke. I heard you. Yeah. yeah. Come back. The market spoke. There's, we listened. Nothing that, bad happened. That's I not what they said in the house, though. They were saying that this was, and they're basing it off of what it could be. Yeah. That's what it is. Oh, yeah. I had a lot of people who came from Pond City Market mm -hmm. with their friends who said this is a new upcoming neighborhood that you want to live in, so this price is a good price compared to what it's going to be. Um, so that's why I'm saying the price wasn't the biggest. A couple of people said the price is a little high. I would drop it to 247 or so because before it was higher. So I just dropped the price on Monday. Yeah, but you're not so really so you're ready hunting the buyer right now, right? Who is also a pioneer with you, right? So you are actively in this neighborhood saying it is time for this revitalization to happen right, right here, yeah. and you're hunting the buyer who says, and I believe it will. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. And th that's what because I was thinking. They're saying. Honestly, the truth is, right now, most of the buyers pulling through that subdivision are saying, I hope it does, mm -hmm. but I don't trust it will. Yeah. So I know when it does, the prices could get up here, but I'm not going to be the one. You know, you know what Brett says about crystal balls? God, we all have that. So, what should a cul-de-sac If you drop the price, are you going to make any money? Um, yeah, I'll make the money. I and mean, it's a learning experience. Yeah, for sure. sure. We did put more into this house than we anticipated um, because we, did, of course, you never know when you go into a house how that's going to be. Um, so that's not the problem. Um, I'll just be like breaking even a little bit, and I need it. To I drop that one, bit. sell it, and then buy that one two houses down, three, there was well, like 30, down, 37, 37 something yeah. and build a nine and keep, and keep doing because it. Because the yeah. best thing you can do now for Ezra Heights is mm -hmm. just to keep running keep, it. Keep yeah. Because yeah. then you well, can be the, the one point. to push the price. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take that first step. And yeah. I don't think, I don't think it's two, almost 250, you're taking it. Okay. So you would say 205. I really would. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> An email and it still may take some time at 205. Yeah, may, I, I, and I, I call every agent that's shown it. I can go back to all the open house people that you that you talk to and mm -hmm. just try to Let sell it through them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you're still in the and market, market the and hard, to refresh get them. new photos that with grass and leaves. Yep. Yeah. To retake your photos mm -hmm. and it comes. The old adage of just take it off the market and relist it, by the way, does not work. And here is why. Love it or hate it. If your property isn't off the market for 32 days, Zillow still shows what it was. Right. Mm -hmm. So unless you're willing to sit off market for 32 days, and right. that is what it takes, and 32 days from the time Zillow realizes it's not on the market, and we feed directly to Zillow, but they also pull from like a thousand other list hub places, and so you have to really let it cycle through the Zillow cycle, because otherwise if you put it on in 15 days or 20 days, 
Zillow will still show previous price mm -hmm. and previous, I mean everything. So unless you have a seller willing to wait that long, mm -hmm. the the whole just pull it off and relist it, it it's just not effective any longer. Mm -hmm. And that's also a conversation you have with your sellers when you talk about pricing it, right? Yeah. Okay, so as new agents, of course we're going to do your method. Who should we run it by before we actually go to our listing presentation? I would go pop into any agent here who's been in production for a while or does a lot of business. Mm -hmm. Yes, to see any of them. How close we Keller are. Keller Williams is so great about open door mentality that I would just swap down in any any agent's office. I would say, do you have five minutes? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? I want to I want to run this by you. Okay. Yeah. Or if you want to get better at it, go pop into those agents who do a lot of listings and say, can I just come with you? I want to privately CMA your listing myself. And then once you take it, I don't need to sit through the presentation with you, but once you take it, can I see how close I came to what you listed it as? That sounds cool. I mean, that, that's a great compare. What you pull versus what they pull. And if you're off, ask them, well, why did you price it here? Help me. Help me learn. Help, Help me learn. Yes. And also go to some open houses and just eavesdrop on a conversation. Like, uh, listen to what the agent holding the house open is saying to the buyers. And just, I mean, you, you don't, like, maybe someone doesn't want you shadowing them, but you can shadow people that are out there putting themselves out there. So I, would, I would say most agents here would not hesitate, you know, I'm, to let you CMA a property I'm putting on the market and then I'll sit down with you and tell you what I actually what well, well, we do. Yep. Get to know your areas. I preach this and preach this when I teach buyer classes. It's just as important on the listing side. Get to know your areas. Go make time block into your Thursday schedule that you're going to go see everything that's come on the market in the last week in four subdivisions. And just start with four subdivisions. And then once you know that subdivision, like the back of your hand, go see a different subdivision. Because you will get to where, you know, you'll get a call in a certain subdivision and you already kind of know what those homes look like, who the builder is, what things make buyers buy in there. Why? Because you've been in those homes. Don't wait to get a buyer to go see homes. Spend your time doing it before you even have a buyer or a seller. Because I can tell you right now, there's about six subdivisions out in my area. If you call me today, I can probably price you and never have walked in your house. Why? Because I've been in every other house every other house in that neighborhood. Several of them I've sold. But that takes time and effort. And a lot of times as agents, especially when we're new, we don't want to take that time and effort because we don't perceive that as talent building, and it really is. You're much more effective on pricing your home when you've seen everything around it for the last six months. Not just pulled up your absorption rate, not just pulled it up for the first time, but you've been in that neighborhood for six months checking out the home. So you're basically saying we have to narrow down the area that we're going to work in? I mean, as a new agent, you would think, like, well, I'm going to just take whatever I get. Oh, yeah, no, just start somewhere. Just just start somewhere. Yeah, like you can take a client from anywhere, but start somewhere. Start with your neighborhood that you live in. Cast your, wa your net a little bit wide and deep. Start pulling up subdivisions in the elementary school around where you live. And then if you get a buyer not anywhere near that, it's okay. But start getting to know the homes around where you are. That will start you learning what houses, you know, what kind of features should you expect to see at a million dollars versus 500. You'd think it'd be obvious, it's not. I think your business drives you. I mean, it you does know, drive you. My buyer clients and stuff took me to a territory that I kind of knew about, but I got, you know, a lot more information about. And so that area has become one of the areas and stuff that I'm kind of focusing on now mm -hmm. because I spent time with them and learned about that territory. So. You might really find as you get to know things you don't want to be in. I know, area. right? I mean, I really don't really want to be there, but I mean, the yes. price points are excellent, and you know, that's yes. okay. But part of pricing your home is knowing its competition, not just pulling up right now what's happening on CMA, but knowing what's been going on. So get out there and go see them. Mm. Mm -mm. I'm ready. Especially if you're a new agent yet, you don't have anything else to do. Go look at home. I mean, I, our business is so simple, it's stupid. It's so simple, it's hard. <laughs> Go look at home. Call your clients. Get and on every day. your Keller Williams mobile app, you can tap the um, <laughs> Ask like Kelly weekend, 
Gotcha. You can tap the open house app and it'll tell you around where you are, where they're going to be open houses on the weekend. So it's doing the research for you. Go to the open house and if it's not a million buyers in it, ask that listing agent, how'd you price this home? Don't do it combatively. Not, I don't like where you're, but I'm a newer agent. Can you help me? How'd you price this home here? What people will you help you. If people will help you. If you're not annoying and if they're not busy. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, because I have, I have a something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did it? So did anybody hear from Maya? No. I thought she said on Monday that she wasn't here. No, but we heard a lot from a red phone that was here earlier. Yeah. <laughs> we can't stop. <laughs> so we have.